Wake up. It's time for Primal Scream. Welcome back to the Primal Scream. I'm Matt. I am Todd. And today we have with us... (laughs) I have chills. I have chills for many reasons. One reason, very big reason, is... I watched her in Survivor, and I thought she was an amazing person, and I loved how she interacted with people. I loved her. her it was very Midwestern. Oh, just her people skills, because yeah. there's a lot of douchebags totally. that get on, <laughs> and you're watching them, and you're like, whether it's the way they edit it, the show, because you can edit something and make somebody look terrible, or however you want them to look. Right. And a lot of people look terrible, or they don't have the people skills. There was a there was a um, a, a Latina, a, a, uh, this Abby. Latin, this Abby, uh. and she came across horribly. horribly. But Denise Stapley, oh. <laughs> she came across like an angel. Not an angel, but she was a wonderful person to watch, and I really enjoyed it. And awesome. She's with us today. Thank awesome. You. On the primal scream. Very exciting. So thank you for coming being with us. I'm excited to be here. So this oh, this will be fun. This is gonna be so awesome. It should be good. <laughs> but before we unwrap the present, which is Denise Stapling. <laughs> I've never heard myself described as a present. You are, uh, lady. A little gem. <laughs> and so I'm Matt, everybody, and I am on the crazy side of this podcast. Todd is more reserved. He's more tree huggery. He's a little bit more... I thought um, we weren't going to do labels. I thought you were a big non-label guy, so you just call me a tree hugger, which I'm happy with. I but said you tree like huggery, me not to say. tree huggery-ish. <clears throat> tree huggery-ish? Okay. All right. But you're right. You're right. I hate labels. Yeah. Ugh. They're sickening. You They're just you, In the past, you've said, listen, stop saying those things. You you're right. open-minded, you're right. thoughtful person. You know what? Right here, right now, yourself. I'm admitting to the world that you're correct and I'm okay. wrong. We always grow. Every time. We grow. We can only hope. So we're going to get back to Denise in a second. Yeah. Or if at any time yeah, you want to chime in, in on some of our current events. we Will do. So when are the current events? What day is it? Sweet. Oh, wait. No, 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 no. It's February. <laughs> if I had a Chuck Kevin on watch on, I'd be able to tell you. <laughs> mm, I don't. Oh, I, don't you dare look at your ah, computer. <laughs> it's the 22nd. Okay. That's you cheated. You cheated. Yep. Totally cheated. But if I had a Chuck Kevin on watch, I wouldn't have to cheat. Yeah. It's so it is. February 22nd. Yes, it is. Yeah. And so we do these uh, current events so that we can kind of timestamp time stamp what's going on. Because too, One too thing often though, we forget what happened five years ago, what exactly. happened six months and ago. And we started this in the idea that we wanted to have a conversation that was kind of uninhibited, but also for our kids. Like at some point they could go back and go, oh, look, what, what was dad, dad like? What dad, what hey, dad? what was grandpa like? <laughs> what? You want to listen to some of his podcasts? He was a crazy bastard. He just, just listened like, to this. He didn't like labels. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but he does talk about crazy stuff. So my wife was watching something on uh, some horrible channel on TV, <laughs> and they were um, there was oh no, and it was Stephen Colbert had a there's a big transsexual thing happening right now where there are men transsexuals who are like they're trying to lobby them to be in um, Victoria's Secret, and so I saw this this the and I caught it mid program and this woman was walking down this runway and i was like holy moses right and i was like wow and then this conversation started and i'm like is that a guy and so my wife says is that yeah, a guy that's, that's a guy oh. and i'm like holy cow and i was like and, and, it, and of course it, it didn't bother me but i was just like going that is an extremely attractive individual. And then Stephen Colbert, not long after, oh, maybe it was the whole thing with Stephen Colbert. He had this lady on. Her name was uh, Janet Mock. And she's an African-American man who has become a woman. And again, I'm watching this woman talk. And I'm like, she is smoking hot. And then she... And, and, and All every, the juices that need to be going no, right now are no, going. No, there's no juices going. No, I'm saying for me. Oh, for you. Okay, <laughs> yeah, good for I'm you. a visual we'll creature. Pull a, we'll pull a picture up later. But it, I was listening to her having a conversation. And again, this is one of those barrier things that I love that crosses. And I love it when I recognize it in myself. And I catch myself going, I'm identifying this person as a, as a woman. But I know that she is... Visually. She, as a visually. But she's a guy, but... She sounds like a woman. She talks like a woman. She looks like a she very... She acts like a woman. And so in my mind, she's a woman. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Without it, not any much discussion about it. And so there has to be a shift. And she was talking about, like, I think Facebook just came out with like 56 different... 
um, ways of describing yourself. So it's not just mm -hmm. male, female. Now it's like mm -hmm. transgender this or mm -hmm. transsexual this. There's like 56 different ways mm -hmm. you can do it. And there's all these right wing kind of crazy things that are going on about it's a guy and a girl. Why does it have to be all these things? And so she was on there just saying, it just needs to have, a, we just need to have a discussion mm -hmm. is what her big, her big point was. But I was just, again, it caught me off, ga off guard as a guy who, again, like you said, visually, you know, that's the thing that works for me is visual stuff. And I was just like, just kind of like caught off guard by how attracted I was to this person. But then it was a guy. You know yeah, what I mean? And so it kind of sure. was a little mind thing. And again, it didn't bother me or it didn't cause me any problems. I'm just going, so I really even, I have to kind of shift my point of view. And so it made me have to stop and say, if I was some, I'm not going to get, I don't want to be mean, but if I'm somebody who has not interacted too, too often with people who are like that, and all of a sudden you're, say you're on the dance floor, you know, and all of a sudden somebody goes, Hey, that lady, he's like, dude, you see how good she, how hot she was, crazy, you know, and that's, that's a guy, and you get pissed, and you, you see these movies or scenarios, where people get upset because they're so caught off guard by, all of a sudden, we find out somebody is a different gender than you thought they were. So I, I think it's good that we have these conversations, and all these different feelings happen, yeah. and I think it's okay to recognize that. I was attracted to somebody because guess what? They are. Mm -hmm. They are. A I would like to hear Denise's take on this because on previous podcasts, I've talked about how I think guys freak out. The guys that mm -hmm. really freak out, I think all of us, I think all of us, no matter who you are, have a sliver. And to whatever degree that sliver is, is a, there's a sliver of homosexuality. There's a sliver of attractiveness. You're attracted in whatever way, whether that's an athletic body and I, and I, I, I appreciate that form or um, when I'm watching porn, am I looking at the size of the guy's cock or am I looking at the woman? And I'm, or, cause I can't watch a porn with a guy with a small penis. I'm just like, <laughs> I just can't do it. <laughs> serious? I, whatever oh, it is, I'm just on. like, no, 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 seriously. I'm, I'm if teasing. I'm watching, if I'm watching porn and I'm, and I think, oh, did that, if and, I'm watching and, and, porn and the guy's hung like a tree log, I'm like, sweet, I'm into this. And Denise says, <laughs> but it's not edit. because, <laughs> edit, edit. <laughs> but it's not because, but it's not because I'm homosexual. It's not because I'm attracted to the guy. There's something about yeah. that that is so manly. I want to see the most manly thing happen to the yeah. most womanly form I can see. That's how I yeah. guess it's the first time yeah. I ever thought about. It, but that's how I look at porn. I think it's a continuum. I mean, I think of you know, like orientation is a continuum it's like you know it's not straight or gay it it's this continuum between you know it's like all of us it's like i could see um you know a, a, a woman you know that's yeah exactly like a little bit more buff and she maybe looks you know a little bit more butch for lack of a better way to describe it but she's more masculine and i think that's pretty attractive i think that's pretty hot i'm not lesbian i don't want to be sexual with her but that's arousing like that's that's a turn on and i think it's that but i think from a male point of view you know todd for you like seeing that it's like somehow you know you see this incredible body walking body, down sure. the wrong run, runway and it's just and then somehow there's this part of your brain though that goes to there's a penis attached to that <laughs> or, or like there this, was a pe or, or there, there was, was or a there penis was, attached because to like that. you said if, if this was a woman has she already had you know reassignment surgery so she's a woman right I mean, she's a woman in every way shape and form and so then it goes you know? to a whole other place where it says okay so i meet somebody and they're an ex I'm, and i'm extremely attracted to them mm -hmm. because they're a woman that i visually see as a woman mm -hmm. and then i mean this is where it gets really convoluted Dude, because are, are we going to get off current events oh yeah because oh, we're way because current events you are know, done okay. at one point this this <laughs> podcast is called the rabbit hole for a reason that's true so I guess it, so. I put myself in the position. So then I'm attracted to somebody because they 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 match what I find sexually attractive, mm -hmm. and I find out that they actually were a man at some point, but now they're a woman, mm -hmm. and they have had the transition. Yep. yep. So then, am I in? Am, am I going to be dating a woman? I guess I am, right? I mean, it was a guy, and they fit every single label that I need for them to have, which I'm attracted to this woman. So they have a vagina now. They no longer have a penis. Everything is has as it should be, quote unquote, right? For me to be attracted to a woman because that's who I'm attracted to as a heterosexual man. Yeah, if you so want to go by the definition. Yeah. Right. If you want to yeah. so 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 now so I mean so in other words, why do we have to make it such a big deal? Because that in itself should be the end of the, the conversation. Right. There's a woman you know, who is now there's a, a a man who was a man at one point but is now fully a woman. 
I'm attracted to women. I find yeah. that person attractive because mm-hmm. they are a woman. What is the uh, what's the conversation after that point? You know, every time we talk about something like this, like we 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 spoke about the NFL or the future NFL football player who just who came out and, and Michael Sam, Michael Sam, and and my opinion on that was, I don't care that you came out. Mm-hmm. It bothers me that we're still so attached to feeling like we have to label ourselves, and if you don't want to be labeled gay, if you don't want to be considered. Mm-hmm. If, I, if you don't want me to look at you and go, oh, there's the gay artist, then don't come out and say, hey, my sex my sex is so important. So I had that. But the more we talk about this, especially today when I was thinking, when we were just talking about what we consider male or female or what we're attracted to. And I started thinking about what am I attracted to? What turns me on or what do I want in my mate? Uh, very feminine form. Uh, somebody who's very caring. I think about all the attributes that my wife, my wife has, and I think about uh, the very last thing is, I want somebody who wants me. I want somebody who, when I come home at night or when I see them, I can see in their eyes that one, they're so happy that their best friend is here. That is a fucking turn on. Mm-hmm. When they see you in the morning, they're happy to see you. It's not one of those, ah, uh, yeah. Or I'm off to the daily grind. You yeah, know, yeah. Kind of but you want that connection, that. And, and I guess I don't. I mean, if you if you apply that to somebody who was a man who is now a woman, she's beautiful. She has all the physical attributes that you would normally associate with a woman. She is he, she, however, cross gendered, uh, transgendered. If they um, treat you the way you want to be treated, and they have that look in the, your, their, their eye that you need to see right. that you're important to them, that I think we all want. We all want to feel important to other people. Uh, my God, why would it matter? Yeah. Why would any of it matter if it was... And I wouldn't have probably said and that. And the weird part is, yeah. do you take this conversation, you remove it, 10 years I was the one of the most homophobic no, no, no. people. I wasn't, going, really. I wasn't going there. I was just saying, you take but it this... it changes. Co- but I was, yeah. You go from this conversation, you take it 10 years in the past. To, would 10 years ago, would... Would I have felt comfortable saying that once I found out that this woman I thought was everything I thought she was as a woman, everything that fulfilled me as a, as a, as a man and my mate, right, had, was now when I found out that she was a man at one point and had transitioned, you know, I'm now thinking that it wouldn't bother me at all. Everything else is fine. So it, everything functions like it mm-hmm. should, in other words. But like 10 or 15 years ago, we had kind of a conversation. It was a, game, it was a movie called The Crying Game. Oh God, I remember yeah. that. And so there's a there's a very f- a feminine boy man, and when he finds out when um, uh, I forget the the actor's name, he's got kind of a lazy eye. Wonderful yeah. actor, <laughs> he does kind of have a lazy. <laughs> eye. I don't does. know how to. I don't want to say well, he's a black uh, actor. It's not the guy from The Butler. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yes, uh, it is. Yes. I can't think of his name. I know. That's terrible. He's a wonderful Fantastic. One. Yes, except for his uh, role with... My favorite thing he was in was with uh, um, Tom Cruise, and uh, he played a he played a lo- like a, a, a pool shark in really? uh, Easy Money with Tom Cruise and Paul Newman. Oh, I don't remember him being in that. One of his first, one of his first movies, Forrest Whitaker. Forrest That's Whitaker. It. Yes. Fast on the Keys. So he was in The Crying Game, and that was kind of... That was my first... Sorry. introduction to that type of topic or conversation of would it matter and it drove that guy crazy mm-hmm. right didn't it didn't yeah. it drive mm-hmm. that character force whitaker crazy mm-hmm. and then did he come to terms with it and then he finally said i don't care i love you anyway yeah i think eventually this was a long time ago that yeah. i saw the movie and he got ran over by guessing. a truck and that's what i remember in the movies that he got ran over it was one of the first like who forest or forest the whitaker or got the, hit by a truck on a, on a road and got ran over i remember the first time watching a movie going oh my god that was horrible like i actually saw somebody die kind of situations that's what i think of when it comes to the crying game isn't that terrible you're trans- thinking of this issues. like incredible Deeper, deep thing between two people, and I'm Dude, like, there was a oh, guy you, you said the crying game. Oh, I thought about in my head it was this guy getting run over by a car, and how horrible I thought it I was. I will, I will never think of the crying game in that way. <laughs> I will always think of the crying game in the form of there's this kid, the there's this guy, social who's changes that took place. A beautiful guy. Yeah, wasn't he the same guy who played in um, Gate uh, something Gate Stargate yeah, Stargate? Yeah, wasn't he the the Egyptian guy? Yeah. Yeah, he was like boom. The fair. raw. He was raw. He was raw yeah. in the yeah. Oh boy. Denise is like, God, as soon as we want to get back to, you want to talk about Survivor <laughs> it's all now? Good. Are we good? 
<laughs> All right. So the next thing is um, there's been this video on TV of, or on the internet, excuse me, the internets of this poor, they're talking about how curling is this like wussy sport and all this kind of stuff. And I love curling, by the way. You do? Uh, I, I really? love, I love You're curling. You're one of five people. I know. I You're love, one of five. I love curling. This Canadian guy is down in the, the bullseye, I'm sure there's a technical term for it, <laughs> area. The target? The, okay, that's wonderful too. And so he is trying to get out of the way and he jumps backwards and slips on the ice and smacks his forehead like right off the ice. Wow. And of course the title is, you thought curling was a safe sport. And this guy really knocks his noggin. Poor guy. And it's terrible. You see it over and over again. And I didn't start mine, so. All right, I got it. Okay. So, uh, I wanted to say that curling is no longer a safe sport because this poor guy went down really, really hard. Dude, um, you, you just can't bubble wrap everything. <laughs> oh, my God. You can't. You can't bubble wrap everything. There's I, just a want, the, I want curling shoes. Their There's shoes are fantastic. Oh. They're like bowling shoes. What? They're really unique for one specific purpose. Yeah, when I was 14, I liked bowling shoes. Oh, God. See, so they, maybe, maybe if we Why do you go back mean? in time, just be mean. you can have some curling I love, shoes. I have a great pair of You know what would annoy me? You know what would annoy bowling me? Shoes. If we have people over on the podcast and you're like, hey, have you checked out my curling shoes? <laughs> <laughs> no? You know oh, what? you haven't noticed them? Because they're... And they're, she would really say hot. she liked them, even if she didn't. It'd be like, those are really nice. Yeah. They look really comfortable. She's a wonderful person. <laughs> also, I was going to say the other day that I saw on RT that we are 46th in the world for freedom of the press. That's Out of all really of the scary. hundred something industrial countries, we're 46th. And I oh. wonder if it has to do with like this whole Snowden Greenberg or Greenwald guy. He's the guy who Snowden gave his stuff to sure. to put it out yep. there. That's terrible. I don't know his last name, but I wonder if it's those things. Do you think it's those parts that people are upset about? Because you, you would know think what? that we're like the freest like the country wiki. in the world. You can say whatever you yeah. want. Well, that that kind of harkens yeah. back to that. HBO show, um, the what? newsroom. Oh, the newsroom. The newsroom. When have you? you know, I have not seen it. Oh, oh god, you love if, it. If you do, if you do get into that stuff, some some of the people that we have on were like, "Hey, I I have no idea what's going on in the world. <laughs> I don't watch the TV. I don't watch movies." Nick Rosine was like, "I live in my gym. Yeah. I have no. If you guys want to talk about I do reality <laughs> TV, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> brainless TV. We will talk. I'm good. We will talk no. brainless TV later. I watch a little bit. If yeah." Oh, you know what? But I think the, freedom of the press is a huge issue, and I wonder yeah. if it, it harks to what we're doing right now. I'm not using my real name because I'm concerned about that. Mm -hmm. Is that a restriction of freedom of the press? Is that what they consider part of that? Well, I think political yeah. correctness is killing Absolutely. in a portion, a portion of freedom of the press. I wouldn't have normally thought that, but I think now from doing this, people are so afraid. Like I was going to ask you, now that you have been a survivor winner mm -hmm. now that you have kind of catapulted yourself into the spotlight a little bit mm -hmm. or a lot i don't know a little bit yeah um your life has changed and do you feel do you feel um you know if you were to talk to people and they say well what would you do when you win the lottery oh i'd feel so free i would do this and i'd do that and i'd and i'd do all this stuff but when you're in the limelight, yeah. you gotta. There are consequences. You think, exactly, you gotta think about. Well, if I say something, yeah. how's it gonna? Is it gonna be taken out of context, or mm -hmm. do I, can I even share that opinion? Yeah, I mean, it was no different. I mean, you you do you you censor yourself. You have to filter it because you have to think about. You know, are there consequences on my job? Are there consequences on my family? Are there? You know, I have a presentation I'm doing in April that I had to really weigh out. Do I really want to go do this? Because it's kind of like outing myself. Mm -hmm. and I'm like, hmm. this is this is going to be an interesting, you know, when I go to post this on Facebook and have the big thing, hey, traveling to Utah, um, it's going to be interesting because there's already been some backlash you're, on it. You're coming out as a Mormon? I'm quite the opposite. <laughs> oh, yeah. okay. Quite the opposite. So I just, I wanted to be the first no, one to break that news. No, so but I mean, no. so, but okay. quite the opposite. But it is, but you do. And, and being in the public eye, you know, it's like, I do, you know, I have to watch a little bit what I say. People know that I'm fairly unfiltered. I mean, in therapy, I'm definitely unfiltered. I'll say what I think. I'm not going to say, hey, nice, nice curling shoes. If, if, they're really fucking ugly curling shoes. Excuse me. Like, I don't know if I can. No, it's but, a, you know, completely like, explicit. You can I just mean, say whatever you want to yeah, say. But I mean, you, you know, you, but you do, you have to filter, you have to be aware of that. So I, I do think that's got to affect the the freedom of press. I mean, because there is, there's, there are huge consequences. Because I've had friends say to me, listen, you know, you're on your own. And I was like, really? And they said, yeah, with your job, I'm sorry. It's just, it's just, you're above everybody. They're going to put you on a pedestal for a reason. And fairly or unfairly, 
that's just the way the mm-hmm. world is. And yeah. I was like, all right. And so I said to him, that's fucking horrible. Well, the, I should be able, and he said, "You're right, absolutely right. I, I mm-hmm. you should be able to say whatever you want to say, but I'm, that's just the way the world is." And so I'm going to attribute that to that 46 percent, because you and I should mm-hmm. be able to put our face anywhere and say whatever we want as private citizens of this country, and it not somebody say, "Oh, well, he thinks that. Why well, he he shouldn't be doing this?" I, I have such mm-hmm. an easy time blaming religion for this, for, uh, for a lot of it, dude. It's, it's valid. It's valid. Todd, Todd and I. <laughs> have Todd and I on previous podcasts have talked about the silliness of religion. It's mm-hmm. okay to be spiritual. Totally. Religion, uh, you have somebody giving you rules. If you want to talk to God or talk to the Supreme something, because you know what? Something did something and now we're here. And it's an amazing thing that I'll never be able to wrap my head around. And There's we, so we, much more than we know. And we go with the whole yeah. Sam Harris kind of ideas that we're agnostic in the sense of. You can't prove me. You can't this prove way. me this way or this way. So guess what? I'm kind of in the I'm middle. I'm totally on the fence. Yep. Yeah. 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 All right. So I'm gonna we, we're gonna dive in here. So we, I might as well just cut this back a little bit. For I have a lot of current events. I don't know why I have so many. I thought it was. Have you watched? Ever seen a House of Cards on Netflix? No. Do you have Netflix? You know I what? Think, we are educating I think I need you to get a life. No, you don't. <laughs> no, 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 no. Probably no. Doing, you're probably, probably, net, you're probably yeah. a productive human like, being, and we're not. Like, yeah, yeah that's probably not. No, so no, I have not. <laughs> so there's a wonderful. It's a show on uh, Netflix. They did their own miniseries, and it's it, every episode is boom on there. So, so you can watch every episode in a row if you want to, and or you can space it out. So it's, it's like based a, it's, off of Henry the Eighth, correct? Is it Henry it's the Eighth? Henry the Eighth, but it's it's um who's the, why am I blanking on the actor? Why he's so freaking you know what? great? We have laptops right here. Yep, I got it right here. So oh. the whole idea of House of Cards is um. It's a type. it's a it's a today it's a it's a political spin off of today using the the forum of Henry the Eighth. So Henry the Eighth would stop, the actor would turn towards the audience and talk to the audience as if this is the inner monologue of the actor. So oh, he's cluing he's cluing the audience in on what's and, going on in his head. And that's well, about the only part that's Henry the the Eighth totally, totally. And so but it's in Congress. And so Kevin Spacey is the guy. Uh, yeah. So he's such a good actor, yeah, right? Yeah, wonderful. And so House of Cards, I heard about it and it had just started trickling into the media about it. And I've always been a, net, a Netflix fan. And so I was like, oh my God, they're doing TV shows. And so I watched this and I'm telling you, I was sucked in for like five days. I watched every, I think, was it summertime that I did this? I don't know, but we went through a time of binge <laughs> watching, which is a new classification it of is. watching television is binge, binge watching. watching. And so I got on there and watched all of them. My wife joined me about halfway through, and she got sucked in. And so the second season came out, and last weekend we spent the entire weekend watching television. It's horrible. It's horrible. Our kids suffered. It was, it was bad. Well, yeah, so, which is bad because you want to have a conversation with somebody like, hey, I just watched Survivor because it was one, it was one day. It was last week. Everybody can kind of plan on that, <laughs> and we're all on the same timeline. But, the but inter- now with binge watching the funny Todd thing comes over and goes hey i watch house of cards <laughs> shut the fuck up because i know you watched every single episode the and funny I'm only thing on is the though, first one is you can get on s- social media and and talk to people who've watched the whole thing already and so you can all so of us can talk it. about what we've already seen right and now i have absolutely no idea why i brought that up oh no i do i do know why okay <laughs> so um so somebody claire underwood is this squirrel the yeah exactly Sorry. oh exactly claire underwood is this um is is uh, kevin spacey's wife who also has her own ambitions and they kind of it, it's, it's like almost a, a modeling of didn't they say the clintons that's what my whole point was Ooh, they're okay. now comparing her to hillary in the Ooh. sense of she has her own her own directions her, her, her own, own agenda agenda but she's also the wife, so she's kind of on his coattails kind of thing. Because he, in the first season, he went from just a regular senator to possibly become becoming the vice president, and he's finagled kind of different things. Yeah, pulling I mean, it's, the it's strings. incredible. Pulling the strings. Yeah, pulling the strings. And so season two is mind-boggling. Uh, the first episode, right? I watched the first episode. I looked at my wife and I was like, "Holy shit! This is going to be so." Goddamn good! I cannot wait. Spoiler, and I, and I hate the idea that I have that much enjoyment <laughs> from a television show. Should I look at my kids and go, "I cannot wait to the individual that you're going to grow up to Listen, be"? Listen, there was a point to be made. There was something important when they used to say, "Kids are supposed to be seen, not heard." I'm just <laughs> kidding. I'm just kidding. I was trying to get beer to come out your nose. It almost worked. Rule number one. Rule number one. Sorry, no making you laugh when you drink. Yep. 
All right. So I thought the Claire Underwood and the Hillary Clinton thing was a really interesting thing. And it's all through Andrew Sullivan. Um, have you ever heard of him? He's a blogger. I'm sorry, Denise. I'll stop saying that to you. <laughs> um, <laughs> have you heard of him? And Do you know this? Like have you seen this? I want, to validate your, I want to validate your ignorance. Exactly. <laughs> no. Like, again, that's what you're saying. Unplugged. No, yeah. she's unplugged. Yeah, I only need fourth thing. grade math to make me feel that. So, yeah, there we exactly. go. <laughs> That'll make me feel ignorant enough. <laughs> Everyday math. That'll oh, make your mind spin. Okay. Who came up with that? I don't Sorry. Know. <laughs> no, it's still like it. I thought the Claire Underwood Hillary Clinton thing was awesome because it made me think. It did. It made me go right to that. I'm like, yeah. Why would you stay with a guy? Blowjobs are fine. If you want to do, if you're going to be. You whoa, know, whoa, gonna, whoa, whoa, whoa. Where's this what you, going? Wait. No, I'm saying, you know, yeah, in what context? A, if you have a husband who's going to do whatever he kind of wants to do, because my mother has met Bill Clinton, and she says, guess what? When you're in I the would room, blow like, him. When, no. Oh, <laughs> dude, you got to. No. You got to set mother. this up better. No, this is bad. bad Your mother bad, bad, is a bad, sexual bad. being. She wrote a porn <laughs> script. Why is it bad? Why is it <laughs> Why is it bad? Every woman. I shouldn't say that. She did say that when you walk, when he walked in the room and he said hi to you and shook your hand. He felt you felt like you were the only person in the room. Yeah. That his care, his he so, so charismatic. charismatic, charismatic. Yeah, absolutely. So then I thought of why would you stay with a guy who obviously was a you woman know, outside a woman outside your marriage? Well, because she had another agenda. She mm-hmm. had her own ambitions, right? And she's a very smart woman. It was a great Secretary of State, I think. Um, so I was just really curious when I read that and I thought, and they didn't start the idea. And again, Andrew Sullivan on the daily dish started this idea of them being similar because Claire Underwood is really vicious, vicious woman. Like her agenda is her agenda. Like to the point, like I think of this one episode in the first season where she says, I don't care if the baby in your stomach withers and dies. I want this and this and this to happen. This is what's going to Yeah, and I was just like, she's, Jesus, she's God. Um, oh, yeah. So in other words, what I have planned is all that matters to me, period. Yeah. And if you're in my way, I'm going to run you over. So again, I don't think necessarily Hillary is like that, but I would think that if you're a driven person, guy or girl, mm-hmm. you're going to... Well, you have certain you know, ambitions and you yeah. want to be the best at something. And in politics, it's kind of like, how are you going to maneuver people? Mm-hmm. Like Survivor, how are you going to maneuver people? Okay. And at the end, you don't really care if you're voted to win the million dollars because you're constantly maneuvering people. I'm going to um, have one more thing and then right. we can be done. Are you Dude, okay? I, I and this is this wait blows. I know this person. blows my mind. This blows my mind. Okay. All right, go ahead. So the company called uh, King Digital they invented uh, Candy Crush for the phone. Uh, yep. Right. What the hell is Candy Crush? It's, it's some a stupid app. game that people get sucked into. Sucked into. into. Yeah, oh. it's terrible. Is it it's as bad Facebook. as Flappy Birds? Or yeah, whatever it's, it's, it's right like that. It's like yep. that in Angry Birds and everything okay. else. Yeah. Brainless. So they made. $1.8 billion last year off of that one that game. App. They made $570 million in peer profit. And they compare that to, if you give you like a perspective, that um, this gaming company uh, earned the same amount as Amazon's lifetime earnings in profit. So this one company yeah. who started an app and a game made more money than Amazon. And the three of us would think of Amazon as being like wow. the end all be all. If I need to, I need something, a book or something, just type Good. it in and order it. Well, this really kind of goes wow. close to home for Todd because recently, uh, well, I'll, I'll bring this back full circle for a second because <coughs> I, I really consider our world a lot like that movie uh, the Mockingbird. What is it? It's uh, what what killed it? not. No, not 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 to not kill him. Not to kill, kill a mockingbird, mockingbird, which is a great book, yeah. great movie. No, the one with um, the recent movie, um, Mocking Jay. Mocking Jay. What? What's no, the? What's the? Good. It's the whole yeah. series. Yeah. Hunger Games. Hunger Games. Oh. Thank you. Yeah. I really okay. consider the Hunger Games kind of a hyper view of what we are as a society because as Americans, we have a lot of silliness. We spend our money on a lot of silliness. We uh, we spend our time. If it's ninety nine cents, I'm gonna buy it on a yeah. lot of silliness. Yeah. It's so silly. Yeah. We have so much money to say that we're in a, in a, a depression or a yeah. recession is it, it it kills me because we still spend money on things we don't need. I mean, my yeah. cell phone bill, just cell phone. Uh, when people say, "Hey, you know what? I don't have as much money as I did fifteen years ago." 
because you didn't have a cell phone plan with five cell phones on it, mm-hmm. which came up to almost three hundred fucking dollars. <laughs> our 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 bill, which I just saw, which my wife takes care of all the bills. I don't never normally ever see it. Five hundred. That's insane. In a month, it's half of my mortgage for your cell phone bill. Yes. That's well, because insane. you have five people. Right. Yeah. On data plan. But it doesn't matter. It, it's something that we got by <laughs> in society. We got we got along fine without it, fifteen years ago. But we well, okay, twenty years ago. But we we now have that, and we have kids that log into their parents' <laughs> Xbox 360 <laughs> account and order two hundred dollars for the games <laughs> without their parents knowing. And it, and, bottom, then, and it bottoms out their checkbook. And it bottoms it out, and then you get overage mm-hmm. charges on every charge that comes through them so after. So we'll just say it, that your wow. beautiful, precious Wonderful angel child number one, or number two, didn't sorry. Didn't realize the didn't consequences n- of his actions. That's putting it oh. nicely. <laughs> Bottom his mom and dad's account out by buying video games on Xbox and cost us about $500 in overdraft charges. Be- uh, and there's no way to recover any of that. Because mm-hmm. that is how we are programming the people of today. It's as easy it's as a click of a button. Mm-hmm. You know, well, when, we, when you talk about Dave Ramsey... That. I don't agree with that because you have to go... Th- even on video games or even on apps for your phone or on What do you mean you don't Amazon, agree with that? A kid you have to just charge $500. Click, but I can click on buy this. Are you sure you want to purchase this? But a click. Child, so he has a choice it's to easy make. As a, it's it's so he, easy a child can do it. It's yeah. so oh, well, easy that a child can Sure, do it. absolutely. But it's still the same point. I'm sitting there with my console... And then a big, huge screen that says, but purchase you're a grown this. Adult. Yeah. But you're a grown adult. And your neurons are connected at yeah. this point. As a, sure front, yeah. as a the child, impulse, the impulse a child has there. no the idea. Is the impulsivity part. is huge. And a, a child has them. no idea to say, this, is, this costs yeah. $30 or this is a free demo. I'm just clicking on a button. Oh, look, I got it. Yep. Exactly. It's, it's, ex- it's accessible. So I got it. Yeah. Sweet. Well, the Xbox hasn't been on for a really long time, so and it won't be for another month. <laughs> Just FYI, there were consequences. Which, by the way, okay. one of your games was a Horrible. game. Horrible. Which was a game that it was Payday. It was it's called Payday, and you're uh, robbing banks. And so I walk back to the. I go to this back room of Todd's house, and, and my kids are playing with his kids, and I go, "Hey, what you playing?" And it's and, my kid playing. And it's his kid playing. He's like, hey, it's Payday. It's great. I go, what do you do with Payday? He goes, watch. And the guy pulls out a gun, and he points it at a, at a woman in the alley, and she gets down, and, and he puts on this clown mask. And I go, no. Um, I my, said no first. Horrible. Yeah. My, and, well, they go, can your kids play? I go, no, they no. cannot. And I said, erase that game, please. Because they said, this is Payday. Can we get it? And they showed me. And what I saw... What I didn't think was like that bad. So I wonder if they should. I don't think they purposely found the most, most you know, innocent, innocent version. thing to find. But what I saw, <laughs> I was like, okay, that doesn't look too bad to me. And so I let the, I let them get it. But then, yeah, Grand Theft Auto. I mean, again, the hard part is, is that. So the whole idea is you should let them buy, you know, G-rated or PG games. And you should let them only watch PG movies. Well, every movie they want to see is at least PG-13, which means they can say fuck once, and they can say shit and bitch and everything else as many times as they want to. And the violence that's involved is whatever they want. So every single Transformer movie, which is only gauged to five and above, right, people... Or or five and below, depending (laughs) on how you want to look at it. Exactly. I mean, so that's the hard part. So then I was... So I watched some of these games, and I'm like... Okay, that's probably not the best idea. I'm like, is it worse than Transformers? I mean, I kind of like, I have a friend you of mine. You gauge it off Transformers? I do. That's your baseline? I have a friend of mine who, <laughs> who bases things off of $20. He's like, $20 to him can buy a pizza? And so okay. he's like, hmm, that's like two pizzas. So I wonder if uh, that's worth it or not. I, I don't know. I get to this point where I'm like, I don't know what to do because... They have all their friends are watching mm-hmm. it, and so I and I'm okay with saying, listen, if your friends went there to watch this and their parents are okay with that, that's fine. But I'm thinking differently, and so I don't think that's okay. And so I'm okay stepping in and doing that. But then there are times where I, as a parent, go, okay, so I took them to see Transformers. That was PG-13. So this game is PG-13. In other words, it's mature. So it's and so equal. I'm thinking, I'm thinking it's, I'm thinking it's equal. And so, so I'm saying, yeah, yeah, it's okay for this, but no, it's not for this. But they're the same. Yeah. 
And so I think that's where I get caught in like this catch 22. Well, and it's hard. It just means, I mean, it's that oversight that we have to, I mean, we have to have that oversight to check that stuff out though, because it's not equal. You're right. It's like PG 13 on a game is not PG 13. And, and, is there, and is there something different of watching somebody get shot in a movie and you being the shooter in the game? To me, that makes a bigger impact as well. And so that's where I've started kind of changing my viewpoint because I'm like, well, if my I'm letting my kid play a game where he gets to kill other people, that I have a huge problem with. But at the same time, I should have a huge problem with because I mean, Transformers. We'll, you know, we'll stick with that one. People die in that all the time. So it's like you know, it's it's a nonchalant. It's you know, and we were going to talk about this later with you as well when it comes to the availability of violence in our culture. Mm-hmm. And the, and the taboo of sexuality and sex. Mm-hmm. And that we've talked about yeah. like women breastfeeding in, in Victoria's Secret and that being some huge issue. And yet there's breasts plastered everywhere, everywhere. around you. Everywhere. Well, like, that was kind of the, it's, a, it's a really weird back and forth because in movies, we have an over sexualization in music, movies, and television. 100%. Yet, sex is taboo. And it's weird because it's the, it death and sex. It's it's what has defined us as a species and every living organism from the moment we've become coherent on this earth. But we totally embrace we we say that's taboo, but we totally embrace violence and like craziness. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and that's, that's okay. But you you know you said earlier you said and I hate to go back to it. I go, you know, I, I think of the clients that I work with and the struggle that they have. It's like, okay, yeah, we have boobs and sex everywhere. Everything's over-sexualized. Yet, depending on their background, if it's been a religious background, they're freaked out. It's like there's this, this crazy thing that happens because we do. It's like as a society, we do one thing, but that culture and that history, that religious piece just creates this conflict, this huge, like, taboo nature of it. And there's, you know, it's trying to figure out how to, I don't know, change that. But I mean, I, I do, I see that huge conflict, sex, death. I mean, well, like European, like commercials, you see a, a, like a soap commercial in Europe. That's like a naked woman yeah. washing herself. Yeah. That's all it is. And it's not sexualized at all. It's just a naked lady scrubbing her body with soap. Mm-hmm. Cause that's what soap is for. It's you a know? culture. Sure. Yeah. It's a culture. And then we turn it into like this, some crazy thing. But you know what? It's, a, a, like, it's on a commercial because it's fucking sexy and sex sells. And I want to see a woman are they, soap herself so are, are, so, are, so are they desensitized then to the sexual mm. aspect of the selling of the soap? I think they're more open. I mean, they're just more open. I mean, they have condom. I mean, Europe, European nations have condom commercials. I mean, oh. active condom commercials. I mean, I remember going to, to Europe when I was in fifth grade. people having sex on TV in a condom commercial? Yeah, basically commercial? they're talking about condoms. I mean, active condom use. I mean, safe sex. They're, it's, you know, it's not abstinence only. I mean, they have such a different take. I mean, I remember traveling to... We went to Europe in fifth grade for a month with my mom. And I remember going up on some ski slope and the family members we were there, it was, it was sunny out, whipped off their tops, laid out. I'm like... Where were you at? Real, in Norway. Sweet. Okay, so Norway. I was, I was, I was, on the list. Right. Where Norway I visit. Norway there you go. Go visit. to Norway. Topless. Norway. <laughs> or I can just get on my phone and, and watch as much up. boobs as I want. There you go. So. But it was totally normal. I mean, so I remember huh. as a fifth grader going, really? I can just... Okay. So we joined in. I mean, it was like this. It was not sexual. It wasn't so sexual. As a, so as a fifth grader. <clears throat> well, I didn't have you, any breast either sure, in fifth but, grade. But, but you were able to just. Yeah. You, and we, you felt comfortable because your environment I, was like that. Well, and, and I hadn't had anything or anyone tell me that that wasn't okay at that point. There oh. was nothing to say that's wrong, that's bad, that's naughty. Um, there's something shameful in that. I mean, that's our entire society says tits are okay on TV, but they're not okay in your house. The shameful part I mean, is the huge, huge shame. part. And the shame, shame is, is huge. The shame and the guilt, I think, affects everybody. And I think it, that's the part that goes back to the religion aspect of totally. it. Totally. Because I joke around with friends of mine who are Catholic, and they're just like, oh, God, that Catholic guilt. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, that's that's what it is. And, and that's, why we're, yeah. <laughs> that's why yeah. I'm not Catholic. Yeah. <laughs> it's I, not just Catholic. It's oh, any, I'm sorry. It's any, yeah. but no, you're, you're right, right. But it is. But it's, yeah, huge. Did you hear about um, Diane, is it Nyad? She I swam know. from oh. Cuba to Florida. Amazing. 52 oh hours. I and how it. old is she? She's like... She's over 50. Oh, my God. It was oh, amazing. She's over 50. She's over 50. And they said that not only was it a oh. long... She swam for 52 hours. She's trying to... Not only is it she is it a long play to go, way to go. She all, It's like 
what? huge schools of jellyfish. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sharks. Yep. Box box fish. Box jellies. Box yep. jellies. Who are the big stingers? Oh, yeah. she was they so swollen death. when she came out of the water. I mean, that was her third and attempt. And it, they found they found her lips and they started stinging her lips because mm-hmm. everything else was covered. When I watched this, oh. I thought of you Didn't because you just get, I got goosebumps watching it. Well, yeah. Todd tells me. Well, Todd was telling me, "Hey, Denise, she's on." Even before uh, Survivor aired, he said, "Oh, Denise is on Survivor, and I I swim with I've swam with her." Yeah. So I was like, "Oh, sweet!" So when I saw this, uh. I thought, "Here's Denise," because it was such an uh, and I'll put this on the um, website and I'll put it on YouTube, but I'll put the link on. There's a video of this, and they the cool thing that, that I thought was uh, initially you're just talking about a woman going from point A to point B mm-hmm. because nobody has done it. Big whoop. It, it neat, neat, yeah, uh, uh, an amazing act of athleticism. But once they start delving into all the things that she had to overcome and do and learn oh. and uh, the strategies involved and um, what what other things have been learned from her doing this. I mean, they did a CAT scan on her to, to see when somebody... Um, is faced with adversity or if somebody is faced with a stressful environment, how does she measure up against Navy SEALs? The oh, bar graph, cool. I'm going to do a little hands thing. You're not going to be able to see it on the podcast, <laughs> obviously. Here's the bar graph, Denise. Navy SEALs on how they deal, what they're, what happens in their brain, their, C, their CT scans, uh, when they are uh, introduced with a stressful environment. And what happens is they put a breathing tube in your mouth and then they restrict the air coming in as you're breathing. You hyperventilate. Right, oh. so they'll give you like a visual that it's coming, and then they'll they're reading the electrodes in your mind of what's starting to trigger yep. and fire. So Navy SEALs here, the lady that swam from Cuba to Florida was way up here, and with they the were the activity sa- with with the activity. Okay. And when does that activity happen? And they were saying this is this is such a unique thing. This woman is such a unique specimen because of how she deals with adversity and she never says no and the fear and how do you get over that fear and it was i thought i was amazed by just the fact that somebody wants to go from point a to point b eh, no big deal but when that happens what are the side effects what spurs off from that Mm -hmm. and what spurred off from this woman going from point a to point b swimming was um inventions in people swimming how do they deal with box jellies Mm -hmm. how to deal with their stings how to long distance swim underwater and keep on 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 course course. because if she's going 50 yards out and 50 yards back to the boat and 50 yards out longer yeah (laughs) to keep her on course to have the brains to have somebody navigating the waters of when when the currents are going in what direction it was just so amazing it was so cool and i think that when you hear that guy who is a marathon swimmer and he goes. Everybody was so saying, "How yeah. did she do?" Forty-eight this? hours is a huge thing. There's like so many people in the world who can oh. do it. Then it's no. It's like it was like twenty-four hours is a, yeah. is a good number, like a hundred something. Oh. And then it was like forty-eight oh. hours. It was down to like sixteen or seventeen. And he's like fifty-two hours oh, in nine. the water yeah. is Stop. is crazy. Think of the and, mental stamina with that. And I am not comparing. I, and I'm not comparing myself to her at all. But I'm telling you, when you swim in the ocean and you have waves and currents mm-hmm. and things happening that aren't in a pool that we all know of, right? It throws you off so badly that that's where that fear factor Mm -hmm. comes in. And in my personal experience, when I did the escape from Alcatraz, I had a point where, I think I've said this before, where there was, there were rolling waves. They weren't crashing with, they were rolling. And so I remember they always told you that at some point, stop swimming and tread water and look at the Golden Gate Bridge because it's so beautiful. So I did that. And when I did that, as he's choking on water, no, as I did that, <laughs> as I did that, I looked to the Golden Gate and there was probably four or five feet of water rolling up this side of me. And then I was like, oh, and I looked over here and there was another wave this side of me. And so I had no, I had no way to focus on anything. And beforehand, they tell you the, the skyline is in head of you and you, you swim towards this point. And as you swim, as the current pulls you, you swim towards this point. And you, it's, it's very calculated. And so I felt comfortable. But at that point, I was at the bottom of this wave and I couldn't see anything at all. And so I had one of those moments, I think one of the only moments in my entire life where I thought, okay, so if I don't just start swimming 
bust my ass from right now, I'm going to be in serious trouble. And I knew at the same time that there were lots of boats and stuff around me, but I felt like that little Cro-Magnon brain thing. I'm in, I'm in trouble if I don't get going. This, I can't just sit here and float all day long. And so you've got to go. Yeah. And so I wonder if you have that trigger inside of you. You know what I mean? That you just, all of a sudden it's like fight or flight. You're mm-hmm. just like, well, that's what oh, they were saying. This woman, had. that's what they were saying. They were absolutely physically able to measure was this woman, this part of the brain that deals with that type of stress. Now me, the idea that I'm swimming with sharks, eh, I'm done. Get me out of the water. Even though I said, even though I told him that there were no sharks, he still wouldn't believe me. I was at a a pond. I basically did the pig man, big man triathlon. Still haven't done that. And I'm swimming in murky water. (laughs) And uh, I know there's no sharks. You have a muskie in there. (laughs) Yeah, but there could be some big fucking cast A big muskie. muskie. And it could take me down. (laughs) Maybe Matt is extremely delicious. (laughs) You never know. You get one bite, maybe I'm delicious. (laughs) And that's it. And I'm done. You do a lot of triathlons. You know, I did. I haven't done. I didn't do any last year, which made me really sad. But I've done. Is it because you took a break? You know, we just got busy last year. And so, and and I've kind of gotten hooked into the mud runs a little bit. I For whatever reason, I really did. Have you done a tough mudder yet? We are doing one in May. So I'm so. Which one are you doing? Um, We're going to do Chicago. So Chicago land area. So we're going to go and. In my May. Husband, in May. So we're gonna go and. Do you think he let? Me, can I, I wonder if I can. I might yeah, go. Yeah, you can join our team. Can I join your team? Yeah. Oh my gosh! How's and I have to remember our team. Boom! Yeah. I'm in. Yeah, absolutely. I've wanted to do Are one for kidding? years, oh and gosh. I've never done it. I've heard they're incredibly fun. I know people huh. who have done them that aren't in the greatest of shape, but they oh. really had a wonderful time doing it. Yeah. Well, that's Fucking the thing. May. I'm all over oh it. Gosh. That's well, plenty of time for me to start running. Totally. Well, and you and you, and you figure it's stop and start, stop and start. I mean, right. it's. Eight to twelve miles, but you know you stop and you start. But the triathlon—I mean, it's such a different yeah, experience you, than the triathlon. You and so I, I did, did the mud run in uh, Illinois. You and I did a mud run. What was that called? It was a Warrior Dash. The Warriors Dash. And it was just yeah. like that. Like you, yep. it's, that, a, it's the, a five. It was five k. Five k. This is ten. Yeah. I know, but again, but we were jogging thing. for a little bit, and then Who's everybody that? has to funnel through those those activities, mm-hmm. those obstacles, and then you're off again. Which and the worst part about that yeah. was I was really hungover. Yeah, you can't do that. Bad. You yeah. can't do that. And with our team, <laughs> the we're leaving you behind. If you're the hungover, day, yeah, you that's our drink, plan. Right? Is okay. You can drink that day and the next day and the day after that. <laughs> I remember going, the day is, before you Why can. is this so hard? I don't know why this is so hard. I do this all the time. And I was like, oh, yeah, it was that 15 beers last night. Yeah, Dang it. Might not help. Yeah, it might help. And it was, it was Matt's first, too. And my yeah. second or third. And I loved Good it. Job. And then I, um, then I had knee surgery. And I haven't been oh, able to run since. Not at all. No. So I'm so very he's envious. A little, sorry. He's, a little, and he's a little paranoid about making sure he doesn't hurt it again. Yeah. He's getting old. It, well, stuff I mean, doesn't they re- bounce back as easy. I was playing kickball, of all things, <laughs> oh. with See, my children. It was so, ho- oh, so awesome of an injury. Now, if anything's then, gonna make a woman said, kickball, if any woman, if anything's gonna make a woman go, oh, he's so sweet. He's playing with his kids, and he, and blew, he blew his, his knee, knee out. out. Yeah. Nice oh. job. And I was. It's not like I was. It's not like I was one of those alpha males that kicked the ball as hard as he could and said, "Fucking eat it." <laughs> you know, and sprinted to first base. I didn't do that shit. I just, I just, I just kicked the ball, and I'm jogging lightly, and my knee just went round oh. and uh, just chewed it up. And they took eighty percent of my meniscus out. So now my big thing, my only thing that I focus on now is that I watch and see what's the latest in therapy for yep. knees and like the stem cell injections yeah. and stuff that. Who is the? Hey, I have a Peyton I have a friend Manning. of mine who is she's getting stem cell therapy for her back. <gasps> really? After I told her, I didn't tell her it was Joe Rogan's podcast. But when he had that whole thing about his stem cell therapy on his podcast, he talked about how he was gonna they were gonna have they were gonna fuse his discs together and do surgery and all this invasive yeah. stuff. He's like, okay, before we do that, I'm gonna try this. And so it was like decompression, stem yeah. cell therapy, and something else. And so I told her, I said, listen, she's had back problems her whole life. I said, just look into this and see if you can find something else. I'd hate for you to go have surgery that just makes things mm-hmm. worse. Because I know people sure. who are still have back problems, even though it's, it's just to solve everything. Hey, right? man, once it's cut out, it's gone. But yep. once you fuse it, it's yep. done, right? Yeah. And so she she just gave me her schedule of what the next three months are of all of her therapy that they've already had planned out for her. And I'm just really hoping that it, it does great things wow. for her. But I'm glad she's doing something a little more holistic than just fucking going there cut and it. sues, mm-hmm. you know, fuse. I said Sue's fuse things together, you know. So Denise, we want to, we do want to talk to you about um, the A A S E C T, ASECT, ASECT, ASECT. And so you are unique 
for Iowa as a sex therapist. What is a sex therapist? Essentially, I'm just a therapist. I mean, at the core of it all, sure. I'm a licensed mental health counselor, but the, the ASEC piece comes in because that's just one of the core things I do is I talk with couples and individuals, whom, whomever it might be, about just anything related to sexuality. It could be orientation issues. It could be libido issues. It could be sexual pain. It could be dysfunction. It just means I'm just there. That's one part of therapy that if someone presents with that, we dive in. I mean, uh-huh. and, you know, unfortunately in Iowa, I'm the only ASEC certified therapist there and so is. It, so that label doesn't really that you don't think it's that big of a deal you're really just a therapist but if you have the opportunity you do d- deal with it's, it it's my specialty so okay. it's, it's this niche oh. of what i do the core of what i probably do is you know depression and anxiety and grief and loss but half the time it all comes back over here huh. and so we're talking about you know couples issues i mean i work with a lot of couples and you know i have a lot of gay and lesbian clients some transgender clients i work with some fetish issues um it's just, it's whatever walks through my door. And Have I never you, know. You ever heard of Dan Savage? I lo- I'm reading his book right I now. You, I love I Dan Savage. Savage. You're going to stop saying that. He is the best. Oh, he is awesome. So oh my, God. my wife and I have listened to Dan Savage <laughs> for like, years. Oh, we, all right. we love Dan it. Savage. He's awesome. And so I have a foster daughter who uh, came out to us when she was living with us. And so we didn't, you know, she, I mean, luckily she found a pretty good couple that we just, we were like, okay, great. That doesn't change you at all. We still love you and care about you. Exactly. That's the sign. That's fine. But I called him and I went on his pod. Uh, it was I don't know if it was a podcast or his radio show at the time. I'm sure it was a podcast. You called Dan Savage. I called him on his radio because you can call in and yeah. ask questions and he'll interview you. And so I called him and said, hey, I gave him my name, my information, kind of what we were dealing with. And he called me back. And then what he does is he, he interviews you. He interviews the call back to you. Got it. Okay. And so... Um, I said, you know, I, I asked him these questions. What can I do to just to support her? What can I do to be there for her kind of thing? And he was fantastic because I had to get over my like, oh, my God, it's Dan Savage because I loved it. He's a wonderful guy. He's Yeah, because he's on Real Time with Bill Maher all the time. Once in a while. Yeah. 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 At the same time, he's a gay. He has a, he's, a, has a, he's gay. He has a partner. They have a son. son. I mean, he's a really – I mean, he's very much – what I like about him for – lack of a better way of putting is that he's just a normal person, which I think he does a great job of making gay couples, families normal. Like normal. Yeah. It's not leftist. It's not. He's just just right in the middle. Now I've said this before and Todd totally disagrees with me. Would you compare him to like the Martin Luther King of gay and lesbian rights? Oh my God. Why do you do that? Because I, I always think of that. I always think of him as kind of. I always well, hear his name because when I think of it'll of get gay and he's lesbian. Well known. I mean, I mean he's, it gets he's, it gets better. Well campaign known. is exactly. a big thing. He's, he's well known. So. He's outspoken. Yeah. I mean, he's he's definitely if, for me. I mean, just because of podcasts and reading, you know, reading his material. I mean, he comes to mind for me. But there are so many. I mean, oh. in terms of the gay and lesbian community, there are so many leaders <laughs> and activists that he's one of so many. But he's definitely one of the. I mean. Absolutely well known, and like you said, Todd, I mean, makes gay and lesbian families not scary to everybody else. Yeah, and I think, and he, and he also points out issues like he says that uh, they live in Seattle, so they go to um, Vancouver to ski, and his son is a snowboarder, and so he says when we go into Canada, there's never any issues with anything. When they try to get back into the United States, is this your husband? Who's that? That's my son. Well, if he's so you're a gay couple and you have a son. It's like he has this problem. Every time he comes back into the United States, he has some kind of issue coming across the border. And he doesn't try to say that you know, there's some big conspiracy against gay people. He's just saying that we obviously still have an issue with the stigmatism of being a gay couple because I can't have a husband and a son and it just be a normal thing. Mm-hmm. Here's a passport. Here's a passport. Here's a passport. Welcome back, to your, welcome back to your country. Yep. You know, and I, one of my favorite things too is um, he has a, a saying called "Get the fuck out." That's one of my favorite things too. Is <laughs> you have it, you it. have to draw the line at some point. So he calls it GTFO. Is that right? Yep. Yeah. So get the fuck out. Like if you are not getting the things that you need, and you've tried really hard, and you've been outspoken, and all these things, and you're still not, it's, you're just done. There's, there's no reason to keep on battling these things. Just be done with it and move on with your life and find the person you're supposed to be with. Yep. You know what? Denise is validating a lot of things. I know. I'm gonna I actually, feel really good I'm right gonna now. I'm going to actually I start totally paying more attention you. to your opinion. Your opinion is <laughs> going to actually matter more you to always, me. You always were good about being 
understanding my okay, opinion. Okay, but I'm this. just going to make it more well known on the podcast. Yes. I'm okay. going to stop battling you so much. No, you should battle me. People like it when you battle. We battle. Okay, so fine. That's a good thing. I still don't agree with you. <laughs> so oh. you went to Iowa State and then you and I. Correct. Okay. Now, are you a Hawkeye fan or are you an Iowa State fan? I'm an Iowa State fan. Actually, even if I say that, my husband will say that I don't even get the right to say that because I couldn't tell you who their coach is. I couldn't tell you a player. It doesn't I don't matter. Watch it, but I'm an Iowa State okay. fan. Did you see the throwback jerseys this year? I Did think you so. catch that? I'm not sure. Okay. Well, a friend <laughs> of mine. What has she been doing with herself? <laughs> uh, she's unplugged, and that's we why she's so healthy. We talked about television. We've Dan talked Savage. about football. She's listening oh, to Dan Savage. Savage. Yeah. Right. And podcasts. There we go. She'll add this podcast, hopefully, exactly. to her. I'll run to it. <laughs> exactly. So I have a friend of mine who, he is a huge Iowa State fan, and he um, designed a throwback jersey, like a modern throwback jersey. I guess there's a website you can go to where... There's like this football player, and you can change different colors and different aspects of the jersey. It's like a Nike thing. Okay. And so he went on as a hot as an Iowa State fan, nothing crazy, and designed this Iowa State jersey. And it was a throwback to, I forget what uh, year it was, okay. but it was a it was the first year that there was an African American player on, and it had three stripes, three uh, yellow stripes, and the rest was maroon. Mm. And so he designed it. He they picked it. They picked it, and he no way. they made his jersey, and they sent him in with his name on it. They played a whole game, That's like a fantastic. throwback game in it. It was really That's really awesome. neat because he he's a he's a graphic artist in Des Moines, and so he was. And again, he was just a fan who would, on my free time I'll just kind of do I something fun. And so he, I, I think there's a. I, think there's a Facebook picture that had his last name on the back and all that stuff. I, I don't know if he got to go to the game or what it was, but it was cool because they put side by side pictures. And so, so here's this high def digital picture of the thing he designed, and then there was like the old kind of jersey, and you could see the really neat Difference. mix of the of the oh, two cool. together. It was really cool. So, I'm you know what's funny is I have a really good friend of mine, and he might be related to Denise, who is like a crazy Hawkeye fan and an anti anti Iowa State fan. Oh. And so I, and so there are times where I'm like, (laughs) you have got to get past this hatred because you know what? They're an Iowa team. And when they, and so he's one of those guys that when Iowa State goes to a bowl game and the Hawkeyes don't, or the Hawkeyes lose or are in a bowl game and Iowa State is, he won't root for Iowa State. I'm like, hey, they're an Iowa team. His panties are all in a bunch. Yeah. Root for you and I. Root for Iowa State. Root for Iowa. We're on the bowl games. Let's go. Let's do it. You know, he's so. Hatred. He's so much hatred for Iowa State. I, I don't understand it. I think it's in the family. I think. I think. Is that what I it think, is? I think it's a little bit in the family because okay. there's a little bit of that with my. <laughs> it's so the relative funny. on my side. Yeah. It's really funny because yeah. you talk about passions and things we get like really fucking pissed about. I there's very been often times I can mention Iowa State and he's like fucking cyclone clowns. So he says fucking cyclones. Yeah. Like, dude, what is this animosity coming from? I just mentioned their name. I know somebody who goes to school there. You know, relax. It's crazy though. Between Candy Crush and the Cyclones, people get crazy. <laughs> you know what else makes people candy crazy? Candy Crush, <laughs> which is a great segue. Oh, you know what else makes people fantastic. crazy? Go ahead. Fifty Shades of Grey. I've still not read it. Can you believe that? I'm a sex therapist and I haven't read it. Oh my really god! I've seen enough so. porn, read enough things like yeah, but so um, yeah. Let me ask you. You haven't read it, but we. This was I know our the idea. basis of it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Tell her yeah. this is great. Yeah. This is like three years ago. Yeah. So when this first came out, Todd's wife is reading it nonstop. You can't stop her. All you're the, like, you're all like hello. You you could knock on her forehead, and she's like, yeah. What? Do you want to have sex? Yeah. In a second, I'm I'm reading. A, I'm I'm reading a really sexy part. So anyway, nothing would generate from that, <laughs> but. So, so that ain't that his frustration, and um, when he would tell me about it, and I kind of I would look up interviews and listen to. Um, I think they had it on NPR. They had some people on to talk about Fifty Shades of Grey and how it's not a new phenomenon. And Danielle Steele's had romance novels out mm-hmm. that are much more risque than this ever is. And, and that's just not true. Yeah, the Daniel, Daniel Steele Steel novels are. Oh, Judy Bloom, wifey from the seventies. There's a Hot. there's vampire I mean, there's porn books stuff. that my mom oh, yeah. gave no, to me. No, but I'm saying Daniel Steele is not a well, Fifty Shades like, of Grey. Like, Dude, softer. The fact maybe. that I said my mom gave me da- vampire porn books should have just stopped you in your <laughs> tracks. <laughs> I've heard it already. That's my fault. I'm sorry. I should have the same reaction I did six months ago. I'm just saying that I think. <laughs> 
Black Daggerhood Dan. Brothers is a great <laughs> series. I Black still think that. Watch it. Read it. There's a difference because I mean I, the same situation okay, happened on yeah. an airplane where I was like sitting, I was reading a book my wife is sitting next to me and I look over and I read the one page on her iPad that's facing me and I'm like holy shit do you want to join the the million dollar hey, or the the mile, mile high, high club, club? oh my wanna, god if you want to do half of what's going on in this page yeah I was like and so and I've made comments like you read any good blowjob scenes recently and she goes. Yeah, there's been a couple. And I'm like, sweet. You know? But but it but, just doesn't pan out like I would like it to. But, but, yeah. but she says it. <laughs> she says it in an excited way. She says it in a way that, yeah, I've read it. Disconnect. Nothing. And so when he would tell me this, and, and I had listened to these interviews on NPR, and I kind of had this gist about the book, and I thought, you know what? There is a huge disconnect mm-hmm. between men and women. And why is it still? Again, we still have no idea how to de- handle death and deal with death. True. Even though it's been around since the dawn of time. And we do it, we deal with it all it the time. It happens all, all the time. time. Yep. And we still have no idea to deal with sexuality between men and women. I mean, back back in the day in the Greeks world, they were ha- the guy, the warriors were having ma- boy lovers, you know, and the women were for making children. But we, we have no idea how to deal with this stuff. And the Fifty Shades of Grey and your frustration, I thought, we should do a survey and because it, there's a disconnect between mm-hmm. what guys think women mm-hmm. want and what gu- what women really want, mm-hmm. and um, why can't we come together some way so there's a better understanding so that you're satisfied as a woman, I'm satisfied as a man, everybody's everything, happy, everything yeah. is kosher, pickles. We so we did the survey. It was called Fifty Shades of Reality. Fifty Shades of Reality. And so we put it out there to our friends and our family, and it was a... Which, there's nothing more uncomfortable <laughs> than, I, oh than no. starting to read through some of these, and you're like, okay, we've only had is 50. We've only had 50. Is that, <laughs> is that, is oh, is that my wife? I know one was like, my, oh my mom. God. It was bad. I know my mom's was bad. <laughs> but we, it, it, what turned out was that we did Survey Monkey. We just thought we'd just do something mm-hmm. crazy, and we invested a couple hundred dollars in it, and we thought, we just, we're going to put this out there and see what happened. And we had 65 really good... Responses. Responses. Um, and we thought, I still, I printed it all off and I still feel like we could actually write something from it. Because we wanted to write a book. We, we wanted, wanted a book. We wanted women and men to be able to read something that was not not geared towards one sex or the other. Anybody Infor- could read it and they could say, oh my God, that's what women think? That makes sense. Or mm-hmm. a woman reads it and goes, I want my husband to read this because mm-hmm. this is how I feel and I haven't been able to say this to him. And I've always told people, because I, I people that I've, I know I send it to to fill out that I've talked to afterwards. I've said we had a response. There was one res- only one response when I that I read that I was like, uh. it was a woman that she said that um, I absolutely hate having sex with my husband when he's drunk. Mm-hmm. It takes forever. It's sloppy mm-hmm. and horrible. There's all these things she named off, mm-hmm. and even though I was like not thinking in my head, oh my god, that's me. I was thinking, oh. I don't want to put my wife through that. That yeah. sounds horrible, you know. Like you don't want to. And so my first thought was way. like, that's why I thought that the idea of the book would work because mm-hmm. I thought even I related with one situation. I was, and I didn't think back to any in moment in particular where I was like, oh yeah, I was drunk that, that one me. time. It was more, yeah, it was more of like, oh, I don't want to put my wife through that. That sounds terrible. Like why would I want to do that? Yeah, why would I do that? And then we had other responses that were like. Um, because we put a question on there, what it, we had some open-ended questions that were more of like, what's the what's the greatest greatest? I, don't, I can't remember the wording. What, what what was one of the you know most wonderful times you had with your spouse, or what turned you on? What what happened when you had one of the greatest like sexual moments in your life, kind of thing? And so we had people that were like, we had ones that were simple as like, oh, I was getting ready to go to a wedding. And I was getting my makeup on in the mirror, and I was standing there leaning towards the mirror, and I had this little black dress on. My husband came in behind me and couldn't believe how good I looked, and we had sex like right there on the spot. And I was like, there you go. It's much more real. Well, you know what I mean? It's like actually, you know, talking, you know, it's like you take away the fluff and you actually communicate about what really, like you said, what really turns you on. What, what do you need? You know, like you talked about your wife reading, you know, Fifty Shades and thinking, oh, like, hey, this is going to get her hot. Well, it's fleeting. <laughs> it it's is. Like, how do I, how do I, 
how do I capture that? How do I trigger that? Because in that moment, it's like it's fleeting and it's gone. And right. having the you know that conversation around, yeah, what's and it wasn't one of those get you hot. And it was one of those situations where I was like, oh my god, she's reading this book and she's not having sex with me. It was more of like, what is intriguing about mm-hmm. this? And then Matt had friends who were literally said, she's reading this book and I'm sitting right next to her. I'm available. Why is this not like happening? They get, they get frustrated and they yeah, yeah, and angry. Yeah. And so we were talking more of like so. So what was funny is that we started talking about it, and I started getting pissed. And he <laughs> goes, and he goes, maybe we're maybe we're seeing it wrong. Maybe we're not. We need to see from a woman's point of view of what the guy, what what's the disconnect between the yeah. two. And so then we because started, a lot of the surveys, or a few of the surveys, I should say, that came back were women saying, I look at it more of a chore. It's mm-hmm. a chore. Mm-hmm. It's something that I have to do. And that's so sad. It, it, when I read those things, sad. I thought, what a bummer. I hear that all the time. All uh, the time. So why what, why do you think that is? Why is it a ch- what is I mean, well, what think, is what is a chore? Okay. If you go back, think of how, you know, just being male and how you were raised. I mean, it's like, you know, you guys are taught or told or, you know, masturbation. I mean, there's a different way that boys are raised from a sexual point of view. I think there's I think there's a difference gender wise. So then you, as an adult, you know, as a, you know, mom, you know, we get stuck in our head. We think I've, I've got to take care of the kids. I've got, I've got all these responsibilities. And here's this little sliver that's left for you. Here's this little sliver that's left for me to be sexual. And so to tap into that, all this other shit has to be taken care of. Like, yeah. it's just, it's just hard. It's, that's the way our brain works, you know? And it's like, so, you know, I talk with women, you know, and so they do, they feel like, oh my God, it's just one more thing I have on my to do. do list. And so I have to work with women on, okay, so what's the secondary gain in that? I get it that you have no libido. I get it that you you have like, that's the last thing you want to do. But what's the secondary path? If that's if it's not that you want to get turned on or you're, you're horny, what's the path? And she said, well, my husband will be happy. So I said, okay, then that's okay. It is. It's a gift. Then look at it not as a chore, but it's, it's like this gift. You're making him happy. It reduces conflict. You get, okay, what else do you, and I just have to get women Talking about well, okay, I do like when we have closeness, or when when I when he actually does want to be sexual, then he's he's nicer to me, or he he does more things around the house. I mean, it's it's crazy, but you do you have to start working on that, getting past that feeling like it's a chore. But I hear that all the time from the female clients, and it's hard it's hard to push against it. And it's part, and it's also I think pretty mainstream now too that it's seen as a chore. Oh. I mean, I hear that. I mean, reality we TV, jo- well, we reality, jo- and we joke about it. You know, like. Oh. I have a friend of mine who's yeah. like, do you remember that old Dunkin' Donuts? Like, time to make the donuts. That's what she says uh-huh. to her husband as a joke. Yeah. As a joke because they're they're not, they're fine. But I was like, oh my God, that is perfect. Mm-hmm. Putting to the same person in the doorway, get time, time to make the, the donuts. donuts, and you're bumping into somebody else. Oh, great. You know, great. I have to go back to work. Well, you know? I have, Matt has family members from opposite sides of the spectrum. My, my folks, when they were still together... Uh, they loved Halloween, dress up Halloween parties. They have big families on both sides, my mom's and my father's. And they would invite everybody and they'd all get dressed up for Halloween and come over and do a big party. One year I was there, uh, left early, and uh, they decided to play the newlywed game. And so everyone's sitting there and they're playing the newlywed game and the, and the question of how many times a year do you have sex? A year. Now, some of my answer uncles said once. Aww. And they got it right. They said once, you know, and they were correct. And my uncle, who is uh, a bachelor, and he's in his 50s easily, he starts laughing. He's like, I have more sex in a week than you guys have in a whole year. (laughs) And then it comes to my father. And my father (laughs) is a special case. Be gentle. Yeah, I love him. He's a special fella. And he goes, "Uh, three, I forget the exact number, but he said something like 375, something like that. And everybody starts laughing at him like, oh, you're so stupid. And uh, you realize there's only so many days in a year. That's more than there are days in a year. And my mom goes, oh, well, then it's probably more. (laughs) Like they're rocking it. Yeah, they they were. But again, I grew up in that type of uh, environment where I looked at sex as um, my dad's taking it. Whether... Whether the, my mom wants to or not, it's happening. Yep. And so I am much less sexual than my father is. I'm I'm the other end of the spectrum than my father is. Okay. I I can't or don't want to have sex unless my lady initiates it or really I can totally tell she wants to. 
because uh, I've seen, I saw my mom, and and we have a very open and com- uh, relationship, my mom and I, where we've talked about sex. I talked to her about the first time I I had sex when I was a teenager, and uh, uh, so seeing that side and seeing what the the frustration, the um, or just what she went through to satisfy my father. Or there was going to be some. So it almost sounds like though you overcompensate for it almost in your own merit, like you're saying, like. But now I kind of back off. Like I, I, I won't unless you unless you give me that. Clear well, yeah, signal. that's just that's just like that's, how I feel you now. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. just how I feel now. Well, and yeah. see, I was raised in the. My mom raised me. I see. I've never had a one night stand. And I have so many Such friends. A that, good boy. I have You're so many Catholic friends that make boy. fun of me because of that. Because my mom and they should. raised me. And they should. <laughs> my mom raised me is that you really should not be having sex with somebody unless you really care and love about them. That's and so usually in that mix means I've dated. You know, I mean, we dated for at least a month. So you're you were like serial monogamous. Yeah. There you serial. Go. You were wow. a serial monogamous. Serial anything. Yeah. I like that. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> so. So I had I, I, people give me a lot of hard times about that because of that idea. But at the same time, I think back to it and I'm like going, I like the fact that we had a thing at my high school in Virginia called a Beach Week. When we graduated, the entire senior class from the high school went to Virginia Beach, and we rented out part of a hotel, whatever how many people it was. Yeah, right? and this is and there was wow. small. This is not well, a small high school. I was 930. I was I was. 336 out of 937 students in my senior class. It's like our entire high school. Exactly. Or right. yeah. bigger. Yeah. And so there's a lot of kids. And so during that time period, I Which, only, Perky, how you doing? <laughs> well, shout out to Perky. <laughs> Which means that during that time period, I was dating somebody at the time. We, why we were down, and so during that time period, people were just hooking up like just crazy because it's like a free for all. You're all 18, you're all out of high school. Free love. Nobody has any boundaries at all. And so I had a girlfriend who came down with me at the time. And then when my girlfriend left, there was a friend of mine that she and I have been friends all through high school. And so then we hooked up when we were down there after her boyfriend and my girlfriend left. And then that relationship lasted about six months as well. And that's, I mean, I want to say we're talking like that's like the third or fourth relationship I've had where I've slept with somebody. And so I have so many friends that give me a hard time about the idea of not, uh, was it, what's that term? Like of? sewing your oats. Sewing like your like, oats. Like you didn't Perfect. sew your oats. I didn't there go out there and like screw everything yeah. kind of thing. But at the same time, I look back on it and I think of, I'm really glad my mom approached it that way with me that's because. Yeah, I mean, you want you want you want to have some kind of investment in something when you're giving yourself to somebody else. That's kind of the way I think about it. I raised my number one son, Junior, as he's been on the podcast, as well. I mean, and he's got a very limited amount of people that he slept with because I don't think necessarily that he didn't want to have the opportunity to sleep with more people, but he was very kind of conscientious mm-hmm. about it. And I think it's okay to be conscientious about it. At the same time, we have a gentleman across from me. Who is the whore? <laughs> That's not very nice to say. Why do you want to put labels on people? I've grown. I've grown. I'm teasing because <clears throat> he's the first. Because you met my ex girl, my he's high the first school person, sweetheart. He's the first person who would say that. At the same time, I was a I horrible met, person. A man whore. I had a conversation with his girlfriend at a club when he's out dancing, and we're, she and I are chatting. And she this goes, is, this, uh, now high school sweetheart to where I come back from the military. And this is like six years, maybe. I mean, there's a yeah. pretty big, big gap. gap. And this okay. is like 15 years ago. Okay. If not a little bit more. And I'm chatting with her. And she is just staring at the at him. And I go, and she goes, and I said, so, you know, how's it going to be? Is it going to be back? What do you think? And she goes, oh, it's great. She And she's looking at the dance floor. I'm like, what do you think? Are you looking at Matt? And she goes, yeah. And I'm like, what do you think? And she goes, I'm thinking that I don't know who that person is. And I'm like, really? And I've known him through a lot of transitions. And I said, he's a pretty wonderful guy. And she goes, yeah, (laughs) I can see that now. I can see that he's changed. She's like, but I have a really hard time dividing what I knew before and after. And I said, and I, I think we've talked about this a lot in the podcast of, 
we're big fans of the journey that we're on. You know, I mean, that you would hope that the journey you're on is is one of change and growing and all those things. And I'm teasing him because he's not a man whore right. anymore. No. So he's a wonderful guy. And so the idea, though, is that, I mean, have you ever seen the movie The Royal Tenenbaums? Yes. Okay. Years so, ago. So here's a guy who is the, the worst father ever, right? The worst father ever. Ding, and by the and, and, one. and the la- <laughs> good. He's Denise like a knows schmuck that. of the dead. She, she in the last quarter of the, in movies. the last quarter of the movie, you know, he becomes a better person, yeah. be, but his whole entire life has been not being a yeah, was like being a horrible person. Absent. And so I I think that, that the idea of this Are you saying that I remember wait, no. I was gonna say, wait a minute, like certain man whores like no. that. Because there's no judgment in no. that. Like, well, I no, wanted no, to no. ask you no, what, I'm not what's saying the difference between how does how does a random person, especially teenagers, and I hope to God there's some teenagers listening to this podcast because this is a, I think a very important question. Because my, my I have young children and they're gonna be teenagers soon. Uh how, as a teenager, with all of this craziness and um, um, YouTube and sexting and social media, how do you know what is taboo, what is uh, natural, what is okay? Do you mean as a parent? Well, like what's natural kid, for them? or well, as, well, for them, there's I think so they, many they parents that, that are unplugged. Us. There's so yeah. many parents yeah. that are unplugged. How do kids... How do kids steer through this socially awkward time in their life when hormones are raging and they don't know what is right or wrong or religious or... And sadly, they don't steer through it easily unless they have parents that are plugged in. I I believe you have to be a plugged in parent or else it's things like, you know, I have adults that, you know, an example of, you know, how somebody steers through that. I might have an adult client that they come in with a fetish issue and it's not necessarily that the fetish is upsetting to them. But they want to understand, why did I have this? And they can go back and go, yeah, it's because I watched this or I saw this. And there was nobody to process that with or explain or to put any kind of a parameter. Or like you say, is it taboo? Is it okay? Is it not okay? You know, it's being able to have kids that have access to healthy adults or somebody to have those conversations with. Because a lot of times it doesn't seem like kids do. And what they have is is smartphones with porn on it constantly. mm -hmm. And... And do you see or have you seen, and, and you don't have to comment if you don't want to, yeah. um, I would think teenagers have these smartphones. I do. I look at porn on my mm-hmm. smartphone. It's easy. It's accessible. Mm-hmm. Is that what they're basing, what women should be reacting? Is that how they're, is that how boys are, are saying women need to act? Or is this how girls are looking at porn and saying, this is what I need to be? I can only tell you based on, I work primarily with adults. Yeah. The adult clients, couples that I come in, we talk about the myths and what they, and, and I'm not, and it kind of shocks me at, at times. I'm like, they really believe this. They really, they've seen so much porn that I have women that come in and their, their expectation around sex is, one, I should come every time. I mean, that's the expectation. Or the men believe that, yep, the, they should be able to please their partner every time the men have to be, you know, Hung, now you're you know, going to blow hung, my I mean, mind. So you know, I mean, I, that's me. Be, that's me. They, I, I, I don't want to have sex unless I know every single time. And that is problematic <laughs> because you are going to be screwed at some point. Because at some point in your marriage, there's going to be a problem. Something's going to happen because you're not going to be 25, 42, 50 for the rest of your life. Sometime there will be a medical issue. Something will happen. And when that happens, and if you haven't, if that's the only expectation you have, it goes is off the, the rails. physical outcome. Yeah, is the physical outcome oh. that that's the only way that I get you know my validation or that's the only way that I can please you. It's like, oh my gosh, no. So I have to work with couples on, you know, what's good enough sex? Well, good enough sex means you're not hung down to your kneecaps. It means my breasts at 40 don't look like the 25-year-old. It means, you know, that women don't, you know, get hot and horny in 30 seconds like they do in the in a porn. Right. It you know, it's that on demand, you know, in, in you know, whether or not it's on a smartphone or, you know, exactly YouTube or wherever they're getting it, whether or not it's teenagers or adults, you know, they are, they're seeing these images that are just not reality. I mean, they're just not. And that is, that's what's, that's what's getting imprinted. And it's one thing if you can take an adult and go, okay, it's okay to ha- access some of that and have it as fantasy. That's right. great. Cause sure. fantasy plays a huge part for a lot of people with arousal and libido. But if that's your reality, We've got Houston. We have a problem. Right. Like, well, I was to say, like, when it comes to porn, 
I mean, I've always thought of porn as a tool. I mean, it takes about 30 seconds. <laughs> really? I watch about 30 seconds to a minute of a porn. Okay, that's for yourself. It. Sure. For myself, for yourself. It, yeah. yeah. You yourself. masturbate, yeah. And you're yeah. done. Yep. I mean, that's, uh, that's yeah. I've, never watched, I've never watched porn and thought, oh, I'm going to try that. <laughs> you know, I've never thought but that some crazy use. thing. Oh. I, I have not been seen, far from that. I have not been far from, oh my God, that is so, I find that so sexy. In whatever scene it is. Mm-hmm. And for guys, it's really... Mm-hmm. I don't know how it is with women because I've never had a very a genuine conversation with with sex uh, with women mm-hmm. and said, uh, I know as a guy, guys are constantly upping the ante. Mm-hmm. Guys are constantly... Yep. If you're a guy and you're watching porn, you're not watching the exact same porn that you were a week ago. You were looking at a different woman having sex. Because guys are constantly mm-hmm. revolving it's that like, door. Yeah. They're constantly up in the ante. They're constantly it's changing like that connect. Yeah, it is a drug. It is and like it is. a drug. You're, you're, the dopamine is releasing in your brain like a drug. Is, when you're one, you're watching it? Mm-hmm. Is, oh, there, again, interesting. Brain, so you think of like, uh, so not metamphetamine. There's something basically that when you watch, it's like if I take a, a bite of chocolate, if I watch porn, if again, those brain scans, you can see it firing. It's like the huh. dopamine, it is. it is, And so you see people who, they call it kind of scaffolding. It's like, oh my gosh, the ante, the ante is always getting up. And, you know, it's like, so people, you know, we have people that, you know, I have clients or I've heard of clients. I, I don't treat sexual addiction. Um, I don't treat sex offenders. It's just not my specialty. Mm-hmm. But you can even distinguish kind of between that, you know, there, there are people that go, oh my gosh, I looked up this porn and it was something I would never have looked up. You know, maybe it's child related and, and we have to go back and say, okay, was there this building up or have you always gone to that kind of porn? Have you always gone to oh, porn that's had, and it's very different because when you see the buildup, it's that, oh my gosh, it's firing, it's firing. And it's like a tolerance. It's like, right. it's, like Interesting. it's like, yeah, you know, girl on girl doesn't do it anymore for me. So I'm going to, yeah, now I'm going to, you know, well, and, sure, and one Dan, cup, two girls. And, and Dan it? Savage helped me with that mm-hmm. in a sense because I remember um, thinking this is this is years ago. Then I'm listening to his podcast, and he had a whole thing about women sh- doing bikini waxes mm-hmm. and being totally shaved, mm-hmm. and how people were getting online saying you're a pedophile, you know. And he's like, and he was saying he's big about saying no, it's 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 not about you know wanting to see an innocent vagina for lack of a better term, mm-hmm. but it's more of like a clean shaven kind of like thing going on, but it has nothing to do with, with children. Pedophilia. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And right. so, but the, but the the leap is made so easy. You Huge. know what I mean? And then at the same time, then you think of the other side of that, where you I know lots of people who do bikini waxes all the time because that's what they think is the sure. norm. And now, sure. You mm-hmm. know, I mean, Kim Kardashian gets a bikini wax all the time. I, you know, you don't have to bring her name up. I'm just ever, saying. I'm ever again. Just saying. <laughs> it's one I'm of those things saying. that actually make me. It, Lose an erection is can we bring yeah. up Kim Kardashian? Kim Kardashian actually makes me soft, which well, a lot you know of people why? would be the opposite for. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. It, it makes she's a soft. very attractive person. But as somebody who's a celebrity no. for a sex tape, is just I, I've 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 been around very um, sexy, beautiful women, and their personalities make them so ugly to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so for ugly. sure. Yep. Uh, I was going to ask you, with the easy accessibility mm-hmm. of porn and the um, like, you were talking about the scaffolding mm-hmm. effect. Is it so, I mean, from a woman's point of view, from a sex therapist's point of view, is it one of those battles that it's just, it's a losing fucking battle for women? It doesn't have to be. I mean, it, I don't know if you, if you mean in terms of how they feel about it. In terms well, of how with, they feel about partners. themselves. Do they, need, do they feel like they need to up the ante all the time? Do they feel, because I would... I think they feel a that guy's part. point I mean, of view is yeah. very simple. Yeah, I think I have you know women from the flip side of it that if you think of having to up the ante or how they're affected by it, it's it's the body image issues. You know, I'll have and it, the most interesting thing that I've had I think in all the years that I've practiced has been having someone who presents to me and they look really sexual, like they look sexualized, like the way that they're dressing, kind of a bit more provocative, um, you know, attractive. They kind of the way they carry themselves, and then as we talk. They are so repressed and so shut off from that. Huh. It's bizarre. It's like there's this, again, that disconnect. It's like they can't, it's like the good girl, bad girl. Mm-hmm. And they just can't fit that. And the porn plays into that because it's, you know, if they have partners that have struggled with it, I have lots of women that, you know, they've had partners that have struggled with that and how it affects them or, or how they've internalized if they've been able to have conversations about it. But I mean, it, porn is not bad. I, I don't think porn is bad. I'm not like pro pro porn anti porn you know it's i've recommended it for couples to talk to have conversations or they need something but for women it definitely 
um, body image issues. I'm trying to think, you know, just well, expectations think, that they think body they have image to perform. Is a, is a bigger thing. Isn't, it, isn't body image it's like not the just num- porn? I mean, that's that's body cheap. image. Do you think? I think I I think that body image is like one of the biggest things. If you don't, and I guess I'm going for myself as well. Mm-hmm. If I don't feel good about how I look, I'm if certain. I don't feel good, if I don't feel sexy. Then why would I want anybody but, else yeah, to want to be naked in front of but you? Compared to, but compared to a woman, no. So, so that's what I'm saying. So, do you think body image affects women more than men, and to the point where sexuality can be stifled because you don't feel good about how you look and who and you don't feel good about who you are? For me, I can only think of you know the clients that, who I work with is predominantly from an individual point women that have reported that. I haven't had as many men that have said, "Yeah, I just don't." Feel, you know, they might like, yeah, but they're. Again, I have men that it doesn't matter. They don't feel like they're they're horny, they're aroused, they want to have sex. For the women that I talk to, definitely report that. Like, no, I don't I don't feel secure in my body. I want to have sex with the lights completely out, um, or not have sex at all, or not have sex at all. I mean, a, avoidance, complete avoidance of it. And so that's just a guy. Is, is is that just a guy girl thing? That I don't know. guys just want to get. I mean, I think Dennis Miller is one who said girls want guys want to guys. Oh God damn it! Dennis Miller said, uh, "Take your time." Guys, say, women want to know what time, and guys want to know at what place. Like it doesn't matter, you know. Mm-hmm. Guys want to get laid, and women want to have schedule a schedule. It? Well, not necessarily have a schedule, but give me a heads up <laughs> about mm-hmm. what's taking place. Is it? Is is that? But that's is not that, just about body image. That's that's that whole libido. It's the fleeting libido. You know, it's it's for me to be in that place. I got to know what time it's like. And I, again, I try and tell couples plan. Is I know it sounds boring. I know it sounds horrible, but if you have kids, um, if you have busy jobs, if you work different hours, you need to plan a schedule. Sex is on Saturday night and your foreplay starts on Sunday, the week before. And foreplay means you start getting the house cleaned. You start making sure the laundry's done. That's what I'm talking about. You start doing all that stuff. How about sexting? Sexting a good thing? Sexting, whatever. (laughs) Wear your sexy underwear. You get your head in the space (laughs) to get to Saturday. I mean, I I joke, and my husband Brett hates it because he knows I talk about him in in therapy. And I'll say, you know, the sexiest he ever is is when I've come home and he's vacuuming. I'm not kidding. It's like he's doing something for me. It's, it's, I should it's be a that god. Connection, it's that caring. It's I like should be a god to my wife. Then, yeah, I oh, think. So well, it is. But it's you're doing something for me, and now I want to do something for you. Even if I'm not in the mood, if I'm not horny, I'm willing. I think that's one of the bigger issues. You what? know, I'm doing something for you. Mm-hmm. Oh. You're doing something for me. Yeah, well, you know what? It is. It's give and take. Um, my parent, my my father and his new wife, whatever. <laughs> But she's really sweet. I don't want to say that and have people go, oh, is she a bitch? No, she's fine. No, she's really nice. She's fine. She's really nice. Whatever. She's not mom. Anyway, they gave my wife and I a wedding present, which it'll be 12 years come May 18th, this May. And um, they gave us a wedding present, and I thought this was one of the coolest things. It was a. It was supposed to be a Bible retreat on how women are supposed to treat your man and marriage coupling type of responsibilities. Oh, that sounds but horrible. I, I yeah. know. I know. Everybody's giving me this weird look. Uh. For all of you at home who are listening to this, I'm getting some really fucking weird looks. <laughs> but um, let me clarify. Let me clarify. This is why it was really cool. We didn't go. First of all, we didn't go to this retreat, but we, we had all this, um, we had all these books and things that we were supposed to fill out for it. Ahead of time. Mm-hmm. So one of the sections was, here's a Q&A with your partner. What do you like? What don't you like? Mm-hmm. What's your love language? So when you, were talking, about, when you were talking about vacuuming. Acts of service. Yeah. My love language compared to my wife's love language. And if you haven't heard of the term love language, let me break it down for you. It's what does it for you. So what does it for me? What What is Matt's love language? It's maybe like a lot of guys it's that physical emotional love response let me pay you attention let me show you let me kiss you let me kiss your cheek let me rub your shoulders whatever it's more of a physical thing for me obviously maybe for my wife it was very startling when i heard it it was you know what when i come home i don't want to think about doing the dishes mm-hmm. and vacuuming and all that what you just said was the vacuuming thing libido's so, gone yeah, so it's what done. I try to do is I try to remove all the chores mm-hmm. from my wife, mm-hmm. which is in a manipulative way, <laughs> removing all resp- all all excuses. But I know it ma- it matters to her. If she can mm-hmm. come home 
and she doesn't feel like, oh, fuck. I got to clean the house. It's a pit. I got to do dishes. I got to do a dinner. I got, I know he has to work tomorrow and I am home all day. So now I got to clean the house all day tomorrow. I got to do all the laundry. If you can remove all those things, that was my wife's love language. Makes your chances much better, doesn't it? <laughs> it does. I mean, it's huge. We it had may not look. happen every time, but it. But just your chances the are it's going to be pretty good. Yeah. But just that Q&A going back and mm-hmm. forth, I learned a lot yeah. of things that having something like that, it removes um, that uncomfortableness. Like, like it's almost like saying it, it's his fault that I'm asking mm-hmm. you these mm-hmm. questions. Do you like it when I do this? Yeah. Oh, you don't. Oh, shit. I thought you did like it when I did this. <laughs> right. Oh, well, I won't fucking yeah. do that anymore. I didn't realize that turned well, you I mean, off. That communication piece, I think, is probably yeah. a, a huge part but of it. But people are so... Because things are so we weird and taboo and, and, and precious and private. We don't have those conversations. You don't. Dude, I mean, if you, if you did another survey and said, how many of you have just had a sexual conversation that wasn't joking or digging or, you know had to be alcohol, whatever, drunken, joking conversation and had a serious conversation about, yeah, do you actually like it when I go down on you? Do you actually like when we have sex on Sunday night or what I'm doing or how our foreplay is? You find out so much more. And that's what, for me in therapy, that's the great thing is I get to set up this environment. Those are the conversations we have. And there's some couples that are so uncomfortable with that right at the start, but it's amazing. I mean, I have a Volvo puppet that will get out and be kind of joke oh, about it. It's shit. awesome. Oh my gosh. Denise is awesome. breaking out the puppets. Oh, I love it. It's, <laughs> I love it. It's, it's literally <laughs> this, awesome. this velvet vulva. I mean, that's what it, it's, it's. Is it really? It is. I stick my hand in it. It's got, oh it's, God, that's fucked awesome. up. It's awesome. It's not. It's, because think of that. <laughs> if you are a couple that can't talk about that, it breaks the ice. It's like you're joking going, okay. Oh, okay. It's, okay. it's that, like to yeah, break the ice. I mean, I'm not like, like that's it's awesome. to joke about it and say, okay, <laughs> let's talk about this. Like when you're talking about how, what are you actually telling him? Because he needs to know what you like and if you don't know do you actually know because i have women that don't know their body i mean that have never seen they've never looked they've never touched again little boys you guys are playing with yourself Constantly. In utero. Mm-hmm. i have yeah. sons and i'm like no no don't yeah. do it like don't do it like, <laughs> like that. don't do it like that you're just hurting <laughs> yeah. yourself don't do that yeah you guys have been doing it since you were little little yeah. girls are not i mean we are given a very be a good girl be a good girl cross your legs in church Sweetie, quit girl. gyrating oh, on your big I mean, stuffed animal. It's yeah. I mean, it's that's shameful. That's yeah, naughty. It is. It's that shame. That so we are given uh-huh. a totally different message. So to expect that your wife or your spouse or your partner is going to be like, oh yeah, I can just. So that was my no. initial reaction of the velvet vulva. Yeah. But I can understand <laughs> how I that awesome can break the ice it's of something. Yeah. It's it's really funny. Yeah. I mean, you can, but we can be serious. I mean, okay, is, now we've I mean, gotten past all the joking yeah. around. But let's be serious. Let's, let's really serious talk about, about like, what do you need? What do you need to be turned on? What do you need? What's the language that, that I need to speak for us to be on the same page? It's funny so. you said that about the books because we, we got a book called um, All About Us. And it's like this little that's red such, book. That's such a good read. I love it. Whatever. <laughs> and <laughs> it's the same thing. It's just filling out things together that like you a might. Like a pre Was yeah, it a pre Like no, a pre-mar- or was it just no, like a it's mar- kind like, of just like a, just like. We didn't do it before we were married, but um, I think it's just kind of like an infor- informational thing, like almost like a conversation starter. Yeah. And so we, I remember doing it in an apartment in California before we were married, sitting down on the couch talking about it and going, and both of us going at different times going, oh, oh, that's cool. I didn't know that. That's really awesome. I'll write that down. You know, kind of those kind of conversations that take place. And I think that that's an aspect of, aspect of sex that gets lost is the conversation. Mm-hmm. So you, you stop just talking about things. Mm-hmm. You just start assuming things and then life gets busy, yep. kids and all that kind of all other stuff. Yep. And all of a sudden you're just like, you're, you're lost in this craziness that we call life. And I think that if you can find, I, I know where that book is. And so, I mean, it makes me think that if you get back to the simpli- simplicity mm-hmm. of two people who are gonna be together and that's what really matters, you know, that's the center of the mm-hmm. life that you should have, whether you have kids or whatever, that if you get back to that, that that central kind of point, then you can start having conversations again. Mm-hmm. You know, because I mean, I certainly didn't bring up the blowjob page. Cup, that cupping of the balls? You're doing sorry. this weird thing with sorry. your hands. Sorry. It's I didn't a non-visual. Talk about blowjobs. When I'm sitting on the plane, I read and I read the page that had this crazy blowjob scene on it, and I was like, "Woohoo! This is awesome! What are you reading that for?" Mm-hmm. You know, 
I did not initiate a conversation after I read that, but I probably but you should could've. have. But you could have and said, yeah. are you actually into that? That's like, awesome. Like, just to be able to say, really? Would you ever consider doing and so, any of that? And, and why didn't I do yeah. that? You know, I mean, that, that's on me. So, I mean, that's what I mean. I, even well, it's on both of you. But, it had, I mean, it, you, the, but the conversation yeah. is not there. Yeah. Or the ability to have the conversation is not there. Or, or it should be initiated. Yeah. Well, and when you have those conversations, then it's it's that novelty comes back to your relationship. It's without that, we do the same thing over and over, and things get boring, and it's mundane. And the whole thing about arousal and libido is novelty. I mean, we have to have things that are that's where porn comes. It's like, why do we like it? Well, because it's novel and it's different, and it's so having some of those conversations can open that back up, and you start becoming new to each other again. Like like you said, like oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know you were into that, or I didn't know that was important to you. I mean, so it, it just really is a huge, huge piece of it. And you, going back to what you said before about when I said, you know, if you're not getting off, it doesn't, you know, that's a turn on for me, though. If I know somebody is getting off, that is a huge turn on to me. But at the same time, I assume that this is the assumption mm-hmm. part that the audience sure. is in trouble is that it should be the same for you. Yeah. And think of that pressure either way. Oh, think information. of that pressure on her. If I know that the only way for you to be okay is if I, if you get me off, then now I'm, I'm tensed and I'm stressed and I'm worried huh. and I'm anxious. And again, libido killers, you have to be able to relax. Sure. I mean, that's where blood flow, I mean, literally you have to be able to get in that headspace and blood's got to be able to go where it needs to go. And if I'm worried and anxious that I'm not getting there fast enough or good enough or quick enough or sure. whatever, it, it, and that's pressure on both sides. I mean, I have men that it's the same thing. It's like they think, oh, my gosh, what if what if I lose my erection? I say, lose it. It'll come back. Like, <laughs> like let it go. Don't, yeah, I don't mean, you know, it's, put I more mean, pressure on yourself. Well, and part of that's just educating men. and It's that difference with men and women. You know, men think, again, it's those myths of the expectation is once I get an erection and I'm hard, I need to be erect and hard through the whole thing. It's not normal to lose that. And it's like, yeah, it is. Do you know women's libido ebbs and flows like all the way through sex? You just don't see it. Holy shit. And you just can't see you just can't see that yeah, I was kinda horny, then it kinda went away. Then I got kinda horny and then it went away. Then I was doing the grocery list and yeah, then, then I, I got horny yeah. and then I was thinking about what I was gonna do tomorrow. Yeah. And then I thought about that video and oh and then I was horny again. <laughs> it you, <laughs> you just you don't see it because we don't have a penis. I mean Oh so okay. you, you so you literally can't tell when our libido ebbs and flows. We can tell when yours does because your erection gets soft, it goes away, it comes back and and we freak out when that happens rather than just saying yeah. Well, so it's a it society, it so it's not a societal just guys, thing. but yeah. ladies also oh, freak, freak out. out and either take it personally or think there's something wrong with you. So it's a huge convert. Again, it's that communication. It's the conversation. It's demystifying it and taking away, you know, kind of the myths of what's supposed to happen. And do you, so. would you say that the essence of it all is that you just have to relax and realize that we're all human beings and that yeah. thing that shit happens. I and mean, so, I mean, so you, you put too much pressure on yourself yeah. as men and women. And so if all of a sudden I start losing my erection, it has nothing to do with you. No, let it go. It's just might be the, the yeah. situation. So you stop what you're doing and you do something else. Yeah. I mean, I mean, so, I mean, it really can be more of a simply relaxed, laid back thing. Do you, so it must be a societal thing then. It is. I mean, if you really, because if you really thought, you know, and I could think for myself and I don't know if both of you could think, you know, if you thought back to a time when you had the best, not even just sex, the best intimate connection with your spouse, or your partner, what was happening? And I go, man, I was just rolling with it. Like, it was like, eh, whatever happens, happens. And because it's totally relaxed, there's no expectation. It's, yeah, we can, we have this huge canvas. We can either stop, we can start, we can, you know, again, it's, yeah, it's, there's no pressure. And that's a huge piece of that connection and passion. Hmm. See, I, I was blew my mind. <laughs> <laughs> We've unwrapped that well, present. Well, the funny part, Boom. what I always, what I always <laughs> am surprised at, is that we build these things up in our minds mm-hmm. to be these problems that really aren't problems. All we have to do is sit back, take a deep breath, well, each relax, of us. and not. Well, yeah, absolutely, and, and not take it so seriously. Mm-hmm. The society. I'm going to give TV a big fucking thumb in the ass as well wow. about it. Cause that, because they might like it. TV might like that. <laughs> yeah, possibly. And, and, and it doesn't make we, you we, bad we, if you like a thumb in your ass, people. <laughs> it doesn't. It's fine. God, I right? wish I had, I wish I had said something me a big else. Thumbs up. I, wish I, fine. I wish I had said something <laughs> different. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> so I'm going to capitalize on that, it. I just think that 
I think that TV and society set us up that something is mm-hmm. not going right or you're not doing There's something right. Or as me as a guy, I'm not doing something. Or as I'm a woman, I don't look the way I should. I mean, if you start throwing in all those societal things, mm-hmm. right, and you take out the conversation between couples and you take out the intimacy that's going on and you let mm-hmm. other things influence you, that sounds like a clusterfuck of disaster to me. But you know what? Exactly. You have to take responsibility at the same time because there's a reason why those things are on TV because we respond to those things that are on TV. And so that's why they're there. So when they show women that are perfect on magazines and they've been airbrushed, when people buy those magazines, when women buy those magazines, they're going to keep putting those magazines out because that's what we want to see. So we have to take some responsibility. And when I said both of us are fucked up, I mean men and women have our own issues. Boys grow up constantly thinking about their dick size. Mm -hmm. They constantly do because Mm -hmm. they have no, I had no idea about true intimacy Mm -hmm. and what matters. And, um, you know, Denise, you said it perfectly when you were like, when were, when was it everything the most intimate, Mm -hmm. not the best sex, just like the most intimate. intimate. It, that can be just heavy petting. Mm -hmm. That can just be foreplay. That can just be being relaxed and making out. When was the last time, ladies and gentlemen, that you just made out with your wife or to, made out with your husband? Yeah. And you were just like, I just fucking love it. We're going to French kiss and we're just going to get fucking crazy. And I don't care. I'm going to have I'm gonna have rug burn <laughs> all over my face because my husband hasn't shaved. And I don't care because that's fucking manly and that's sexy and I love it. When was the last time that shit happened? I mean, we all did uh-huh. it as teenagers. But then we stopped. And then we stopped. And yeah. why is that? Because I remember, I remember, like, like you said, halitosis, serious makeout sessions with my wife, and that was the turn on. And that was the turn on. Well, I mean, I would consider that part of foreplay, anyways. But I mean, and then that slowly bleeds away. Mm-hmm. And it's like, but that was the best part. You wonder what what takes place, dude. That's crazy. Because when ahead. I when Finish I grab when I grab my wife's hair and we start kissing passionately, that is the best sex. That's the best sexual experience when we start getting to the point where we're just making out crazy. Mm-hmm. When that make out, that crazy mm-hmm. make out session happens, that's the best. Yeah. When when it when that doesn't happen, it's like a uh, that's a three or a four. The crazy uh-huh. make out sessions, that's like a nine or a ten. Yeah. Huh. <laughs> that's just kind of like what's funny like, is I have this I'm picture of, of Denise's husband in my head and Denise. Oh, me grabbing Denise's terrible. husband's hair no 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 no. because okay. he can make I out I said Denise and her husband I didn't okay. say you Sorry. at all well, you have a bald head as I do it's pretty serious so I'm, I'm sure it's kind of hard to imagine you know or I don't know what that image is in your head but but you know you said you know you there's that time in your life you know and I, and I can remember back to when Brad and I first dated yeah and we made out for hours I mean I remember being there was no sex at all no there it was wasn't. just making it was out this anticipation or this the first time like you felt that skin like mm-hmm. like just oh my god I the felt smell. the skin or this and feeling that and knowing and then yeah it's like quick then it's like oh we kiss for five minutes or we're kind of kissing while we're making out or we haven't said and part of that you think you know it, I think we just we get lazy we forget how important that is and we just have to kind of go back and remind that but then you think as kids and you said all those things like how do we help our kids because they're you know kind of navigate through this they're being exposed to everything that they see out there is it's quick you don't see couples on tv or in a movie making out for two hours no you see them <laughs> making out for 30 seconds they whip their clothes off right apparently the woman's it, like wet like it's an aggr- <laughs> it's an aggressive right. painful like, uh, thing it, it, it's, it's like, like when i see people yeah when it's you see intimate, people kiss on movies it's, it's, it's not so it's not. It might hard be. It, and it might be for them but it, it's yeah probably not there's more to it and i'll give you this uh kevin costner he's a the actor yeah i when love I watching see, him make out when i see his make out scenes <laughs> his make out scenes i believe are the way he probably kisses his wife i mean they're really like Slow, and I, I mean this could be what, a director like, what and stuff. But I'm telling you, is that every movie single, you thinking of? every movie I've ever seen Kevin Costner in, his not, makeout scenes, scenes. I don't see him anything. making out in anything. All right, all right. Dancing his with wolves. Makeout <laughs> scenes are they are all the, first of all they're all the same. Tatanka <laughs> Oh, but come on, this is a good movie. Dance I don't remember wolves. him making him make out with anything. Dance with wolves. Oh, anyways. anybody. All right, so all the makeout scenes I've ever seen Kevin Costner in, I see him kissing, and I'm like. I guarantee because of the way he mm. kisses and they're 
all the same in all the different movies, I'm like, I bet you he kisses his wife like that. That's why I look at it and I go, oh, wow, that's really an intense, intimate connection between two people. All right. Yeah, and I think that sense. to me, that's the hard part is that to me, kissing has always been like the end all be all because it's always the start. I mean, kissing mm. is usually where it kind of begins, you know? Yeah, yeah. good point. You know, and, and my wife would make fun of me because, you know, she was under the, I think she was kind of under the vi- the the idea of kind of like the standard, you know, three dates, you have sex and those kind of things. And I said, <laughs> and I and Brett she hugged screwed. me. I want to say she hugged me. I said, I, I want to say that I hugged her goodbye, hugged her goodbye the first time. And I think I kissed her goodbye on the third date. And I wanted to say it was three weeks in before I ever thought about wanting to be no, 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 intimate no. Re- with her. Replace that comment. Okay. Thought you, you thought about in. you thought about what? It wasn't after the three weeks you thought about being intimate. Okay. So you're saying that I you was think thinking it... about having sex with her before that? Yeah. Okay. So I was having I was thinking about having sex with her before that, but I knew that I wanted to make sure that the connection was there before that happened. Definitely. And so the kissing was more important to me. The hu- I'm a big hugger. I'm intimacy and hugging is more important to me before be- besides sex. Okay, any I can go in the bathroom in 30 seconds and be just fine. So I don't need to think about having sex with somebody unless it has some kind of intimacy involved. Mm-hmm. And so I took my time purposely because of that, and I was. 30 at the time hopefully i had a little bit of life underneath me that i was not going to jump into these 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 stereotypical social kind of ways of mm-hmm. being mm-hmm. and i knew that it was that important to me that i was not going to make those kind of leaps i had a child as well and so you start adding those kind of things yeah. on top of it but at the same time just for me personally it was more of having the intimacy involved mm-hmm. and again i'll go back to my mother and as nutty as she is and we will agree that she's nuts. I've never met but, her, but she sounds like a fascinating lady. She is a fascinating lady. She's a brilliant woman. Brilliant woman. But she's a little bonkers. And <laughs> But she taught me from the very beginning. And I say that with love. Love you, Mom. I say that with love, and she knows that. Um, she taught me from the very beginning that you just don't yeah. leap into those things. It's but, just not yeah. part of that. It's just not part of what we do as as you're going to be my kid, you know, you're going to know how to do your own laundry, cook your own yeah. food, and you don't just fucking bang anything that you see in front of you. So think how lucky you were. Because I can tell you, the majority of kids do not get to have that kind of conversation with their parents. You know, I'm, we're raising our daughter very openly. I mean, we've been talking, we've been talking to her about, about, not sex, but body parts and sexual health and, you know, sexuality since she was four. I mean, reading and having those conversations, but the piece that gets missed is that piece that your mom said, you know, around that it's not that you don't do it. It's that you do it with thought and you do it with meaning and you do it with someone that you have feelings for caring versus, you know, the message that again is still so prevalent. Again, sex ed classes, you know, they've gotten a little bit better, but I doubt that there's any place unless in a sexual education curriculum in our schools that talks about pleasure It'll talk about the function, mechanics. It'll talk about STDs. It'll sure. And it'll talk about. It goes back to that shame. It goes back to the shame. But we're not going to talk to them to kids about relationships and how do you choose a partner and how do you actually decide when you should or want to really make this decision. That really is a big decision. Sure. You know when you're going to have sex with somebody or be intimate with somebody. You know, I don't don't think it was until my mid twenties that I actually even felt confident or comfortable saying, Mm -hmm. "Yeah, I masturbate." Right. Fuck it, everybody does. Yeah. It wasn't until my twenties, my mid twenties, that I that idea even mm-hmm. thought. You know what? Fuck it. I'm pretty sure everybody <laughs> does. Pretty and yeah. if you don't, that's, you're the minority. Mm-hmm. But, well, I feel really yeah. lucky because Junior. I want to say when he was 11, he and I were driving somewhere. I think we were meeting his mom somewhere to to transfer him. And I remember we had we had the sex talk, and he was 11. Mm-hmm. And I remember driving my I remember driving my car and going. Okay, this is it. It's happening. It's happening right now. It's like it was like one of those like <laughs> like moments in your life. Where you're like, okay, I hope I handle this okay. And I remember we had this long talk, and I just thought I would just be really open and honest with him to a point. And then um, we were talking about condoms, and he goes, "Boy, I bet you it's really awkward to stop doing what you're doing and put on a condom onto your penis." 
And I remember sitting there driving going, holy shit, this kid's got me by a yard. Because wow. I like remember. He got it. Yeah, he got it right away. And I remember going, oh, I am golden. Because if he can realize now how important it is to have that, that awkward that moment. You can, that you can mm-hmm. be so caught up in mm-hmm. the moment that yeah. you're like, to be able to have some clear thinking to go, oh, wait, let's be responsible. Mm-hmm. And from what mm-hmm. I know, that he's had those moments and he's stopped and made the, uh, and made a good choice well, because he was thinking about mm-hmm. it. You know what I mean? And so I remember having that conversation and going, oh, you know what? I give him a little pat on my back. I'm like, okay, he understands that shit can happen. He can get caught up in the moment. You still have to mm-hmm. stop and be smart about things. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't matter what interrupts, whatever that, you know, is it here? I've heard plenty of people say, oh, I'm not going to stop and put a condom on. That'll blow the mood. Well, do you want babies? Do you want a baby or do you want to blow the mood? You know what ruins the mood? Uh, A baby crying at 3 (laughs) a.m. And then a baby crying at 3.30 and then 3.45 and 4 o'clock. That kills it. (laughs) Do you want to hear my favorite favorite story? Would love to. This is totally off the subject. Nice segue. I I had a friend of mine. Who told me this story? And it was he and his wife went out to dinner, and uh, they came home and they were in their bedroom messing around. And all of a sudden, she start they're naked in a bed, and they she starts saying, "I'm burning down there." You know why am I why am oh I burning why am I burning down there? And she stops and they were she having goes, "Sex at the time." Yeah, yeah. And he was touching her, and she started having <laughs> burning. And so she hops up. She's burning bad enough. She hops up and she goes in the bathroom and washes her vagina because Listen. something's burning. <laughs> and somebody stops and says, oh, shit, I had chicken wings for dinner shit. and I didn't wash my, my hands. My bad. Oh, okay. It was oh, my bad. You? <laughs> You're such a oh, dick. Yes, it's my bad. I was oh a my, young fella, wait, and so I wasn't just thinking. Put Tabasco sauce I basically put Tabasco her. sauce inside her vagina. Oh. Which, by the way, that's my ex-wife, and can, I hope you enjoyed this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> we can always edit that whole thing oh, out. My no, we can we're not going to edit it out. It's a funny thing because Dad, people do silly, the, stupid things. But that's the shit that happens in our bedroom. Yes. And, and that's, that's the, the stuff best to be part. able to talk and go, oh, my God, that's the shit that happens in our bedrooms that we have to be able to talk about and say, oh, my God, do you oh remember God. the time when you put Tabasco sauce in my vagina? Right. <laughs> like, what a nightmare <laughs> was. You know? That's, that's right. something that if you're 16 years old and you're listening to this podcast, you're going to think, Oh, I don't have to go through that because t- or wash your hands. Is Matt wash, and- yes, good <laughs> good hygiene. You know what? Is that That's always. a sign of a good lover. Is good. Um, you gotta like trim the gotta, nails. Yeah, trim you gotta the trim nails. the nails. You gotta take care of your hands. Keep the grounds clean. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I mean, I thank, hear, I thank hear you so much for bringing. That I up. thought that would be a fun thing. That was awesome. Anyways, I love it. <laughs> I hear so many stories of people, but the same thing of like. Um, I was watching, there was something on HBO that had like, uh, it was a, a porn kind of thing that was talking about. Was it the bunnies? The bunny house? No, not that one. But it was a different <laughs> one where they were like taking, they were like interviewing people who were in porn and like filming them why they were having these porn sessions oh. and like talking, like, like interviewing the actresses and actresses actors and actresses and they're like, you know, the crazy positions they're in and they'd have to stop and the girl had to stop sit back and stretch her leg out because she had her leg up in some fucking crazy angle and it's not normal. And she's like, yeah, it's just, it's so hard because they want this kind of thing and it's so not normal. Yeah. And I had to stop and stretch out a little bit, you know? And so when you talk about the idea of like fluffers and things like that in porn, it's real because mm-hmm. she's got to stop and she's got to stretch out her hip because it's all been stressed out and somebody else has to keep this guy hard. You know what? I don't want, I wonder if fluffers got, if, if the fluffer union, Got demor- got destroyed. There's no union. There's no union for fluffers. No. All right. When when that little blue pill came out and guys yeah. could just pop a pill and then I don't need a fluffer anymore because I'm con- I'm I'm hard. By the way, I've been hard for five hours. Should I leave? <laughs> that would be an issue. You that know what's funny? Are. Like you is do that not want to have your penis guys hard who are these hours. these porn guys <laughs> who are young vibrant guys yeah. are taking Viagra because it, it doesn't stop. Yeah. Well, they can keep going. Yeah. Here's the problem. Here's the problem. Why should we feel like we need to have an erection for even an hour. No woman wants you to have an erection for an hour. Our Shh. vagina does not want you to have an erection for an hour. She said, no. oh. we there want you go. it done 20 minutes in and out, close up shop. Done I deal. mean, here's the reality. If you, if you are with your, and this is one of those educational pieces that I have partners in spot that go, 
I never knew that. It's like, think of it, depending on what's happening in your own bedrooms. Let's say your, your spouse climaxes. You have three to five minutes before the shop is closing. Meaning, just like you, after you come, your penis gets soft, things shrink, it's done. Same thing with their body. So things start drying up, things stop lubricating. So if you keep going for another half an hour after that, even if you it, haven't, it's really it's okay. really not pleasurable. So if 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 we've already climaxed and you still have another forty five minutes, half an hour to go, and you're not using any other kind of lubrication, that can get really painful. And and a lot of women won't say anything. They won't. They'll just keep going. I mean, they'll oh. just. And it's so it's really just the body just starts to shut down. Wow, that sounds yeah. bad. Yeah. Just I yeah, really at, yeah, at, yeah, at this point yeah. I'm like oh yeah. sex does not sound like a chocolate chip cookie right now <laughs> yeah. it doesn't sound yummy right now but it but is you know, it, at you the just same have, time you have to we, just time your cooking we talk yeah, <laughs> yeah there you go time your cooking put in some extra chips and you know what I want to do oh god I want to have high five moment I want to have sex fantastic. I want to have a podcast time your cooking I want to have a, a a sex podcast sex with Denise. Once a month. I would love to have you on. I would love to have Denise come on and do like a little segment every once in a while and go, hey, this is, what, this is what's going on right now. And this is what I want to, uh, this is my little advice for the month. The, rec- the recipe for the day? The cooking for the, the day? recipe mm. for the day. Mm. If I like that. If climax, then you got a, you got a limited time. You, you do. Now, well, and, and that goes to the whole thing that what I talked about. I was like, well, if, if she hasn't. I really feel like I haven't done my job. But maybe she's just not going to. Right. I mean, so then you, you have to have that conversation. Say, you know, and as a woman, I have to be willing to have that conversation or just be able to say, you know what? I'm good. I'm good. You, let's just take a break for tonight. Like, I've, I've gotten everything I need. You don't have to keep working on it. You don't have to keep trying. <laughs> you know, okay. take responsibility. Oh, you God, know, there's a great, so great book. I le- There's one of the books. I le- It's called Sex for One. And it's by a woman named Betty Dodson, and she's like in her 80s now. But she was, she was a performance artist in the in the 60s and 70s, and she's in my field. She's just a huge name, and she's just quite wild. Like she would take, she's taken very young lovers. Like she had a like a 23 year old lover when she was in her 60s or 70s. Like and Harold and Maude. I mean, she's <laughs> she's a wild woman. But one of the biggest things I took away from this book was you have to take responsibility for your own orgasm. Like, you are not responsible for my orgasm. Well, clearly you are not. Um, but, you know, my, my husband is not responsible for my orgasm. I am. And if I don't get myself there, then I have to be okay with that and let him know. And, and it's kind of that, rela- like, just relax. Because otherwise, you're feeling this pressure to make your, you know, make right. your spouse climb. It's, it's just, it's taking that ownership. Like, take... And if you both take, take ownership... Then you should be then you're okay, okay together. Yeah. 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 So is it one of those oh, things like... Solve all uh, our problems right there. Yeah. Piece of cake. Is it one of those things where... Because I've, I've heard this or I've said it even in the past where, you know what? If you don't tell me this is enjoyable, that's your fault. Mm-hmm. And if I'm having sex and I get off and you don't, that's your deal. Yeah. If you If you can't tell me that and you can't give me any feedback to improve what's happening, then it's on you. I mean, no, I fully agree with that. It's It's... You have to be able to have those conversations. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. You know, and somebody else who I think has kind of been kind of graying in that line is uh, is that Lena Dunham? She wrote. She has that show called Girls on HBO. Yeah, not to be oh. confused with Leah, Leah Dunham, so which is by Lena, the way Lena Lena Dunham, who is the writer, producer, actress who's on HBO right. on Girls, I mean, and they make a big deal about her, her because being naked on all the time. Right. Well, and, I mean, well, you know what? What is a unique? I love the show because I feel like I'm getting an insight into something that I'm really unaware of. That's why I like watching it. But yeah, she is naked all the time. Where she's, she's, okay. she's at some point of undress at some point in the show, and so it makes what I like about it is I'm watching a show that seems to me like real life. It's her going into the bedroom, taking her clothes off, putting things on, and going out again. And it's not. It's it's, it's not like a sexualized. Yeah, no, it's, it's not just, at all. It's life. It's, yeah, and it, she's in a, okay. like the most recent episode. She was in a bikini the whole time, right? And she is what we would consider societal wise to be obese, you know. But to me, at again, least not, this goes back to the idea. At of, least not a model, right? Not, no, no, yeah. not at all. And especially along with um, Mrs. Williams, Brian Williams' daughter is on this show, and uh, again, she has other people who you would consider more attractive mm-hmm. societal wise. Sure. But I like her a lot because I like the idea that she just doesn't care. Mm-hmm. I'm going to be myself. 
Mm-hmm. It says who I am. If you don't like me in a bikini, fuck you. I'm in a bikini. Go look somewhere else. And this is how I'm going to live my life. And I think that she is breaking some of those societal mm-hmm. barriers. And that's why I like her. Because, I mean, again, I look at her and I wouldn't say, oh, God, she makes me hot. But I do find her attractive because I like her. Her personality, her personality, and I could see myself yeah. liking her as a person and being attracted. And like, say, I would, I would, I would date her because I like her personality, mm-hmm. and this has anything to do with her body at all because she feels so comfortable with how she looks mm-hmm. and who she is, and that is a big attractor to me. Mm-hmm. That you're just ownership, you know. So you're a little heavy. Oh, who cares? Yeah. You know, if you were happy with who you are and you're and you're happy with where you're at right now. You know, I don't think she looks in the mirror and goes, oh, God, I better go to CrossFit or, oh, God, I better get on this juice diet or whatever. She thinks, you know what? I'm OK. I'm happy with, with the way I am. And maybe she isn't. I'm just saying that she gives the persona of those kind of things. Well, and it makes me think of there's a quote that I used to use in some of my presentations. It's a, I think it's a Maya Angelou uh, quote. And it's essentially if, if I'm comfortable in my own skin, then I can help other people com- become comfortable in theirs. I mean, it's just that essence, like you said, of. Her owning that and being comfortable, like what that, what that, how that impacted you or how that impacts somebody else or your partner or whoever you're with. If you are comfortable and you can just own it and be who you are and like you said, not give a shit. Right. Um, it, it puts other people at ease. Right. And if you so. see things on TV like that, when we are presented with all these, when we have a, what is an hour and a half Victoria's Secret model runway concert yeah right? seriously with, these, with this perfection na- naked naked when, ladies when you walking see, down the runway and when you see her to me it's almost like a like a slap in the face of going okay awesome for them they look great mm-hmm. good for them this is reality most women are going to be built like her it's just the way it is most women are what 10 to 14 yeah. size pants yeah. or we dress or whatever bumps. yeah it's like normal and so when i see things like that it, i'm attracted to the norm the, the normalcy of it like this is reality i and enjoy something that is real to me i don't want to i am very aware of when i'm being presented that seems so flashy and superficial i'm sure they're wonderful people <laughs> but when i see a, a million dollar push-up bra made out of diamonds or whatever yeah. i'm just like okay okay you know that to me it's, it's so blatant you know to appeal to my sexual Cro Magnon thing. I'm just like, oh, okay, you're hot. I agree with you. You know what I mean? But honestly, if I saw Leah, Lena Dunham, yeah, not Leah, not Leah, English professor or English major, major Lena Dunham, <laughs> I would say that I would find her, I would much rather date her than her. Not that I don't know anything about her, you know, or that they're bad people either way or the other, but she seems a little more real to me. Mm-hmm. And that seems a lot more attractive. Yeah. Yeah, I this conversation is going to be so different in six years when my child is <laughs> when my oldest beautiful princess <laughs> is uh, flowering, so to speak. When she's in the rut, yeah, of high school, yeah, it, it's going to be so much different. Mm. I I really wish it wouldn't be different. I really wish I could be very laid back and and. And protective, but I know that her influences, she's going to be looking so much more at how do I compare visually, sexually mm-hmm. to these but women imp- in the media. But you can impact that, though, dude. I'm a dad. Do you know what impacts? Uh, well, I should you say can do, how little you can impact. That? I know my. I know that a dad impacts his daughter hugely. But when a when a girl's a teenager. She's not listening to parents. She's listening to her peers. And yes, a parent gives influence, but the, just don't stop. That's no, what I'm no, saying. No. Just I don't would never stop, stop being influential. No, to no, her. no. Could I? Do you really think I could ever stop? No, I don't. No. I'm gonna say something. <laughs> Either way, mm, maybe you don't let your nipple show. Maybe well, I'll say now, that. Denise, you have a daughter in daughter. the same age, kind ten. of ten years ten. old. Yes, mm-hmm. ten. Yeah. Full so on maybe puberty. you and I can have. Oh yeah, uh, counseling. Oh, because we're <laughs> we're in full on puberty right now. Yes, like 
okay, we need to have the talks because it's the roller coaster of moods and stuff's popping out and it, oh yeah. So we had the masturbation talk last week. It was great. Really? Oh, mm-hmm. snap. Maybe I, I, I figured need... it was time. No. It's, you thought it was time or she thought brought it up to you? Well, we, again, we've been reading stuff. So I said, you know, it's probably time we start talking, you know, because we've talked, she's like, well, what if I get my period at school? I mean, she's at 10. She said, I don't Good really for wanna, her. I don't really want to go to the nurse. And I said, well, we'll, we'll get you prepared. And she said, well, I don't want to use a tampon because I want to stick something up in there. Right. I said, well, there are options. <laughs> right. We have options. And so I said, well, let's get out the book. I said, because I really don't want you to be freaked out. Like, let's let's make sure. And she said, yeah, sweet. One day we she literally has the book sitting on her bed stand and we go back to it. What, what book is this? Um, there's a series called It's Not the It starts with It's Not the Stork. And it was like for ages four. Um, I can't remember. That's the starting book of the series. It, it's not the it's stork. It's not the stork. We'll have the, we'll um, have the book series on the website. Harris, Harris, and I can't think of what the, what the other author is, but one is Harris, and I can't think of who it is, but it's a great series, and it's kind of cartoon stuff, but it's truly accurate information. Like the first okay. book starts talking about sex. It doesn't give any details. It doesn't sure. give because it's age appropriate, but so in this one it goes into... You know everything from you know puberty. There's more, and she, you know, she's at she's ten, so she laughs at the boy. Like, oh my God, like I don't want to see the, you know, that's just gross. <laughs> right. You know, right. She's hit that hit that point of view, but you know they have a chapter on mastery. So I said, you want to talk about this? I said, well, let's just start reading and talking. She's like, why would somebody do that? <laughs> I said, well, and I said you may not, you may not want to, but I mean, we just started having the conversation, and it, there's it's that how much is she ready for? What's the sign of like? Yeah, okay, that's that's enough information for it. And you know, and I check in every now and then. Do you have any questions? Anything you want to talk about? Like, no, I've I've had enough. And I mean, because we know she's aware of her body, you know, and, and as those hormones, especially now with pu- it's like, you know, I know. I know because I've been there. It's like sure. you know, and talking with other friends, like, okay, when did you first start going back and thinking, when did you first start really becoming aware of feelings, you know, feelings and sensations? It's like, oh my gosh, you know, we can go back to Yeah. You know, way back. You know, I thought it's time. Like yeah, this conversation is good. long overdue. Now, would you well, recommend uh, moms having this conversation? Mom, she's she would have been mom is going to be the one. Yeah, she would have been mortified if my husband had had. Like she even said, "I don't want dad in the room." I said, "Okay." All like right. she's she's kind of hit that. We used to read the book well, together. Well, that's sweet. And I'm now out. She's to that <laughs> same sex. I mean, just for that. I mean, it's just like, that yeah, like awkward yeah, part like, of this it. This is like the awkward. Like we're talking well, about. See, like, the first time I masturbated was eleven. For sure, eleven years old. I remember the time and the place. Jesus. Well, and yeah. I remember also. Oh, good for you. Easy. Good for you. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. I remember the time and the place. It was very romantic. I lit candles. <laughs> it was, it was nothing like the that. movie. The it movie was, was all like American that. girls. <laughs> there was no movie. Anyways, and I remember the first time with Junior, and I think he'll be okay with this. Is that him talking to me, saying, "I want to say it's what dream nocturnal emissions, mm-hmm. the clinical term." Yep. And him talking to me, and I'm like, going, okay, yeah. And he goes, I talked to so-and-so about it. And I'm like, and he's done it too. He, he had it happen too. I'm like, awesome. Okay, good. What's up? And he's like, is that okay? What do you think? And I was like, oh, dude, that's totally normal. And he did, I remember him crying. Yeah. And I'm like, well, he's an emotional guy anyways. A big, lovey sweetheart. Big, sweetie. big sweetie pie. Yeah. And he's like, and he, he, I remember him being really emotional about it. I'm like, but what's, what are you wrong? I really thought there was something wrong with me. Yep. And I'm like... Oh my God! Just if you only idea. knew how much time I spent by myself in the bathroom, <laughs> yeah. you would be flabbergasted. That I get so much done during a day. <laughs> but the key thing, and so is, yeah, I mean, he had to have somebody else just recognize. Yeah. It was just recognizing that what you're doing is okay. Yeah. It's it's totally normal. And so, unfortunately, from that, it was like a love fest. We had long showers. My water bill is going up. I had to get a hell? bigger water heater. It was crazy. <laughs> but that's it. You said it's normal. And that's right. And that in having that conversation with her, that was the main thing. It's this is totally normal. If you do it, okay. If you don't, that's okay. You just have to hear the parameters. Yeah. Take and, a long and shower say it's okay. in your room. You don't do it with friends. I mean, literally we just put right. those parameters on. You know, not not out in the living room. I mean <laughs> yeah. Well, you're good I mean, because you have yeah. two boys and one girl. Yeah. So you got two for one. Your wife will take care of one, and you'll take care uh, of two. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose. For sure. Yeah. And it depends uh, on their comfort. Maybe maybe they'll be comfortable with you. I just know yeah. um, it I, was, my daughter was not comfortable I just kept thinking, should I make Robbie, comment about Robbie or Roby H. Harris? Roby, Roby, Roby H. 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 Harris. Yes. One's It's perfectly normal. Um, the other one's It's, it's Not, not the, the Stork. It's Not the Stork, a book about boys, girls, and babies. Yep. 
And that's, I mean, it's pretty basic. And so we're on the last one right now. So it, it includes and they go, everything. They go age by age? Age like four and up. Wow. Um, and we actually know, oh you know what? God. We started reading that to Sydney when she was three because I brought it home from a conference. She was, it's four and up. We started reading it at three with her. Wow. Um, and it just gets, it. it's like it keeps going over the same information with a little bit more detail Good. every time. Kind so, of I mean, reinforcing things before. Yeah. I mean, the how, pra- long have, how long have you been a therapist? Uh, I've been a therapist. I've been um, practicing since 96, but I've been in wow. private practice since 2007. So the clinical specialty, like the sex therapy piece, didn't start until, gosh, was it 2000? Okay. And so, you're from, are you initially from Cedar Rapids? Uh, from Marion. Born and raised in Marion. Oh, really? Yeah. Born and I raised. I think I knew that. Yeah, born and raised. This is my hometown. And then nice. kind of made the triangle and came back home. So, and, okay. it, and it just, and so to be able to have that specialty here yeah. is, I mean, we're pretty repressed. Right? I mean, <laughs> well, you know what? We I are, mean, a, we are definitely a blue collar kind of repressed town. I'll give you that for sure. And, and Chuck Cavanaugh and I, and us have talked about that as well. I think though that there, I wonder if it's every hometown or if it's Cedar Rapids, because I want to say that the people that we've had on the podcast who are from Cedar Rapids and myself included have such, and I'm not a native of Cedar Rapids. I came here when I was eight, um, have such a deep held feeling for Cedar Rapids. You know what I mean? I mean, yeah. it really is deep. Some, I mean, yeah. you don't hear, I mean, you, it's hard for you to uh, disclaim uh, Chuck's Chuck's point of view of I'm sandbagging at Mount Mercy or at Mount at Mercy mm-hmm. Hospital and I want to bring my town back. And so I thought, what business can I start to do that? Or you have Sauce Hockey who says, I want to start a business because I found a niche that I thought I mm-hmm. could fill and I want to give back to the world because mm-hmm. they have, they have a, uh, a nonprofit, you know. What is it about Cedar Rapids, I wonder, that people want to come back here? Because Junior is already saying, you know what? I've realized now. I've been gone six months. Mm-hmm. He's, I, re- I, I tell him all the time, you've been gone a very small amount of time. Sliver. And he says, I've come to the, the realization that my home is Cedar Rapids, and I can't wait till I learn all the things I learned in the Air Force, and I want to come back. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, wow, that's so surprising. You like Two months ago at... Re, you know, basic training graduation. You were saying New York, San Francisco, all these worldly things, and he's like, "Yeah, I think I'll have an opportunity to see some of these places, or I'll be able to, to go out into the world in the Air Force." I think I'm going to want to come back mm-hmm. to a place that I know that I feel great at, and I can still. He must be a firefighter or a yeah. cop, I believe, and so. I wonder what it is about Cedar Rapids. I don't know. Or is it a Midwest or thing? I, I remember years ago, Midwest we, yeah. I, I don't know if it is, but we have, I have a good friend of mine that lives out in San Francisco and she and her um, significant other at the time were coming to Chicago and I hadn't seen her in years and they were coming to Chicago. She was going to run the, the Chicago marathon. And I said, oh my gosh, like, tell me when we're there. We are there. And she's like, what? You're going to drive four hours <laughs> just to, see. I'm like, of course. She's like, Nobody out here would do that. She said, people won't drive 30 minutes across town to spend time with you. So I don't know if that's a Midwest thing versus a West Coast thing of just that connection, that willingness and that interest in actually connecting. Like I came back, I love, you know, it's, I've had people say, well, what do you like about Cedar Rapids? I don't know. There's not really. (laughs) There's nothing to do. There's nothing nothing to do, but it's comfortable here. It's, it's like my family's here. My connections are here. You know, I know, you know, when I go into Hy-Vee, I know who the clerk's going to be. You know, I know, you know, it's, well, it, there's a connection. There's, that's, there's the first a familiarity. I, that's the first time I saw you after Survivor. I hadn't seen you forever. And I saw you in high V. Yeah. And exactly. I was like, is it okay if I come talk to you? Because there's a bodyguard somewhere. You're a famous star now. <laughs> and we were joking around about it. But we were just in the grocery store. You right. know what I mean? I mean, I think that's part it's of it. It's that familiarity. It's yeah. that comfort. And so people come back. I mean, I, you hear it all the time. People who have moved away that want to get back here. You know, I had a friend of mine from Survivor that came and visited in August. And at first I was like, oh my God, you know, here comes, you know, Malcolm. This is a 26 year old kid. He's going to think this is like the most boring <laughs> backwoods. place. Backwoods place. I, I was kind of like <laughs> anxious. Apprehend- anxious. I was yeah. really anxious. Huh. Like, what am I going to do? What are we like? How are we going to entertain him for? And I took him down to Nubo because Sweet. I love Nubo. Oh, and Nubo right. is, it's, yeah. it's this little gem in it our, is. in our, in town, you know, and took him down there and he was like, you guys are so like, self-deprecating about your town. And I said, you know what? You are absolutely right. 
our town, like it really does kick ass. We, we have rock. This, we have this gem and this. Hell yeah. And so he kind of put it into perspective. Like That's you nice. need to really appreciate what you um, have, what you have. And this is really cool. And he even walked in like to, into Nubo and said, I did not expect this. Like this was not what I expected. Like this is really cool. I'm like, yeah, we actually <laughs> have some cool stuff here. But hey, if he know. ever comes back, if he ever comes back to town, he will be at the and Tough And you want to come on. Oh, he's going to be at the Tough Mudder. He'll but it'll be, be Chicago, yeah, though. That, you know, I guess Chicago. that won't work. He'll yeah. be in Cedar Rapids. Yeah. Mm. Oh, that would be fun. It'd be fun to have him yeah. on. Because, I mean, again, one of, the, one of the things I was looking forward to, to talking to you today was not, not just Survivor, but um, what else do you do with your life, your child, your husband, all the things you do? And I thought it would be the same thing. If Malcolm was ever around, I, I know that he was an athlete in college, mm-hmm. and the, it's the snippets that they give you on the TV show, and, and that's he, about it. Dartmouth? Is he a teacher, or was he Dartmouth. a teacher? He, he taught, um, he went to Micronesia for a year, and taught English um, there for a year, and Good. then came back and graduated, and was an economics, economics major. Wanted to be, which is interesting, wanted to be a philosophy major, but it wasn't allowed. Huh. So hopefully his parents never listened. Now to wasn't this there podcast. A, there was an edit, episode but. on your season of Survivor where he got to be with kids and it was a big it was a big yeah, deal for it was him. A big I deal. mean it was an emotional mm-hmm. thing for him. Yeah, which was was a very drawing. I mean you really mm-hmm. you really liked him as a as a character because mm-hmm. you, you wonder how much is being edited and what. But when I saw that, I thought, what a unique person. Yeah, well that's I think it very, kind of reminded him. Yeah, it's something that yeah. I wouldn't have seen. Mm-hmm. You've probably had this happen a number of times. Watching that final thing when he was talking to you and he was pissed, stop I was so head. angry. Don't yeah, sh- stop shaking don't your shake head. Your head. I was, listen, <laughs> don't, don't, I, don't do I, it. Was I was doing so this. When he was asking questions, I was doing this. Oh, <gasps> I'll stop shaking my head. I'm sorry. So I, my first <laughs> thought was like, don't fucking talk to me like that. That's all right. I, I called mean, him a dick after it was over, so good for you. <laughs> so you fucking my first dick. thought was like, why would you? Because I mean, that is. Because I mean. <laughs> You, it's a normal response when somebody is talking to you and you're kind of understanding mm-hmm. what they're saying and you're getting it. You're validating. You're that validating they're what they're something. saying, and then they get pissed at you. And so even I, it wasn't just necessarily you that he was talking to that yeah. bothered me. It was more of like, don't be an asshole because everybody responds like that. Yeah. Well, let me preface that. Yes, it was because it was you and I like you and I know you. But I was just saying that I was just like, well, why are you being an asshole? Is it the moment that's happening? I mean, that's what I thought it was. I thought it was all TV drama. And so at first I was like, what are you fucking, what are you, what are you doing? And then I was like, okay, this is television. I'm going to you know, from relax. A, from a spectator, yeah. from a spectator, there's very few people because it is such a, it's a competition, and, it, and it's a weird thing. Because I love Survivor, I love watching the show so much. I've watched it since season two. I never saw season one. Never even went back to watch season one. Season two on, my wife and I, and and to see every year when that tribal council comes and to watch the dynamics of the whole season and how are people going to get voted to win? Is it because you're you were that master player because you manipulated mm-hmm. people or was it because you were a likable player mm-hmm. or was it because you um, stabbed people in the back or was it because you won so many challenges? There's so many different facets mm-hmm. and because but, of that, each season mm-hmm. is different. It depends on who that group of people were. Do they value the player yep. versus the person who's winning the immunities versus yeah. the likable character? Mm-hmm. And don't you think it was overall... Because you were athletic enough, people knew you and liked you, and that was—I mean, that's why I think I liked. I again, I have not I have seen no other season before or after Denise's because that's the only reason I, I so watched. To compare it to, sorry, <laughs> yeah, I have nothing to compare it to. But I heard about so much backstabbing. I was awesome. <laughs> you were I'm awesome. Kidding. I'm kidding. You were awesome. She was Shocking. awesome. She was awesome. I remember <laughs> with with my wife and I. I remember, there was like a, a swimming one. I'm like, she's fucking gonna kill this. She's like, what do you mean? Like, I know. I've seen her swim. I know how good a swimmer she is. She's gonna do awesome. Except we don't swim with ropes in our right, hands. Right. Exactly. Or, yeah. <laughs> you know. But I think I, I don't know. I thought that you overall, because you were pretty honest and upfront most mm-hmm. of the time, and you did a good job during the competition part of it, that that's why you won. And I thought that that's why I thought that I enjoyed that season again because I heard about so many of the manipulative kind of backstabbing mm-hmm. shitty things that happened and all the other mm-hmm. stuff, and it happened during mm-hmm. this one too. Because, yeah, who was that Latin it girl? It happens in every... That Abby, Latin girl was... Oh, Abby. she was terrible. So anyways, I just couldn't wait until she got off the show because I just... I, can we get her out of the show so I can watch some fun things and I don't have to deal with her anymore? Yeah. So, I mean, I thought I thought that she won because of, she had kind of all those pieces. And I think you're right. It, and, it, and 
I, that definitely helped. I mean, when you the reality is when you go out there, you are who you are. And luckily, it played in my favor. Whoever I am, you know, whether or not, I, mean, I don't know if that's the Midwest thing. I don't know if that was being a therapist. I don't know if that's just being able to kind of adapt and truly be interested. Like I went out there and I was genuinely interested in the people I was spending time with. Because you're on that island 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I want to get to know. Like I want to get to know. And people out there are so mistrusting of that, you know. So it helped though that I truly was interested in getting to know people. And sure. so I guess it was nice. I wasn't, hopefully it wasn't, other than to Abby, I wasn't a real bitch, I don't know. You, you weren't know? a bitch to Abby. Mm, they were really kind. I just said this in another interview, you know, with the editors, the the producers could have <coughs> made my edit look much more sarcastic with Abby in every confessional if they asked me about her. I did has, not have nice no things to say. Well, no holds she barred. No I mean, I would have She called, was a I mean, nice I was, person. I was like, she's a, you know, I, I she's remember. She's not a nice person. Oh, I'm never, sorry. There are people who are just aren't nice no. people. I well, she, yeah. And I understand yeah. why. And again, it was, in the, it was yeah. in the edit that we saw. The edit, the edit that, that, you that saw. we saw. No, I didn't she's saying that she's not a nice person. I know, but listen. Well, I'm saying was, I was, I was, an, I, I was who I was. When, if you, right. I have, everybody has their tolerance, and mm-hmm. she was horrid out there. <laughs> if I mean, you, I, if you're a therapist oh. and your tolerance is pretty goddamn high, yeah. And if you've breached the tolerance yeah. of a therapist who's open mm-hmm. and thoughtful and caring yeah. about things, yeah. you know. But listen, I mean, I've never oh, been. I've never. Come on. I'm not gonna be. Dickhead, I'm trying to be loving. Give me a second. <laughs> Give me a moment. Survivor, from a spectator point of view, is what I keep seeing and hearing is the toughest, one of the most grueling mental, physical thing that you can do. You're you're challenging yourself physically. You're challenging yourself emotionally. Mm-hmm. You're challenging yourself socially. You're you're so freaked out. Be, of trying to win and trying to align yourself with the right people and hoping mm, that you're not you're not aligning yourself with the wrong people and making every every day is like a chess piece move. Besides and, everything else, and there's people. If you've watched more than one season, you would know there's people that just lose their shit, and that's when they've lost the game because they just can't take this obnoxious person over here, and they just can't button it. They just can't keep their lips shut, and they just explode, and they let their emotion and their anger go, which was one of the things, which was probably the thing of you and Malcolm that I watched, and I thought, holy shit, this is one of those amazing talents that people can have is listening, knowing when to say something, having the power, the willpower to bite that tongue, Mm -hmm. Were you, not a, let it go. were you a buffer for each other, kind of, in that sense? Yeah, we definitely would go in, like, after challenges or different, and just bitch with each other. I mean, so in terms of a buffer, it was, that was the one place we could Vent go be under, like, like, oh my God, what the fuck just happened in that challenge? Like, seriously, can you not climb out of the water and grab onto a ladder? Right. Like, really, how hard is that? We couldn't do that back with the rest of the tribe. Sure. But we could go in the jungle and bitch and moan. But what you just said, it just triggered me right back. You know, we had that whole conversation about sex. Survivor is no different than sex. You have to be able to adapt and to survive it and not lose your shit. To to not get overly paranoid, to not have things just go horribly wrong. You just have to be able to relax. And being out there, that's the producers, I think, I probably drove the, I was probably kind of boring on at some points to the producers because it's, you know, are you nervous about what the vote is or this? you know, it, it'll <laughs> it'll be what it'll be. I can't worry that much about it. I know from, how I'm, I'm from, voting. I'm from Iowa. Yeah, like like you <laughs> know what? I'm just laid back. Yeah, like I know who I'm voting for. Um, I've got to trust that my alliance is going to follow through, and if not, I guess I go home. And, like, and, and it was still a good experience, just like sex, even if it goes bad. It's still a good nice. experience. So, I mean, there, there's this. It's like never made that connection until just now. Survivor is like sex. Wow, so, Jeff Ropes. There Put that go. on your commercials. There we go. <laughs> we that, thought we that'll be have my a, new blog on my, what, what was my the, page. What was the, one, what was the <laughs> thing we needed to put out there once in a while? We thought about doing a, a publicity thing. What was that thing called? There's a thing. We don't ever publicize our podcast. We just do it via people in our pod, in our website. But what's the... Uh, is it a public... It's not a publication. What is the... Yeah, it's kind of like a publication. But what's we're, the term? I'm not sure where you get a hold oh. of the newspapers and they and they and put you it can out. Actually, put it out like there that we like, like an, we can say Denise from Survivor, blah blah blah, and then people pick it up. Like an art, not like an it RSS would, like it, like it, like Huffington Post, and like it would, like it, like it, like it would be broadcasted out there gotcha. that hey, this is 
this is this is happening, and then they link to the podcast and stuff like that. So that'd be great. I love I like I said I love Survivor and I love watching it and um, when we talked earlier about they're bringing into Survivor some new aspects mm-hmm. the last season of Survivor they brought in blood versus water which at times really upset me mm-hmm. at times it really upset me and I thought you know what this game is getting to the point to where it brings out the worst in people mm-hmm. it's not going to bring out the best in people it's going to bring out the worst in people and I'm and I'm starting to feel guilty for watching it. And then I watched an episode of that season where the mom was getting voted out by the daughter mm-hmm. and the mom said, you know what? I'm proud that my daughter is um, tough enough mm-hmm. and mature enough to say, you're going to bring me down. I have to vote you out. Mm-hmm. And she voted off her own mom. Mm-hmm. Whoa. So, it was so awesome. I did think. It was awesome. Yeah, I was, did was, think was, that was, that was a good season. It's real. It was real. And it was that she was strong enough. And the and mom said, the I was proud of her. Enough. Yeah. To be able to do that. Huh. Yeah, 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 yeah. And now you're having this new season. And, and Survivor is one of those things that I'm surprised that it's still as popular as the day it came out because mm-hmm. they've changed it just a little bit, but it's still uniquely the, about the same. But here's mm-hmm. the new thing. Have you seen the new thing? Oh, I'm so I don't know which new thing. The it's, new thing is there's a new type of immunity idol. Oh, no, that's not new, though. After... But you can use they're, it after the. They've done it in two past seasons. <laughs> but they're bring, they did. They're giving they're giving me? Tyler Perry all this credit. Tyler Perry didn't come Wait, up with this. When did they? Um, Cook Islands. Yule. That's they how Yule won. It, they they Yule could use it after. Idol. Yule had an idol that could be played after the votes were read, and there was one other season that they had. It hasn't. It was only in two two other seasons. I'm excited because I'm like, think of the power of that. Oh, oh my if, gosh. Oh my gosh. If you like, had like, that, if you could, if oh. you had that, you wouldn't have to tell anybody. You no. wouldn't have to tell anybody. I just have money and in back you could be, you could do whatever you want and be like, oh, so you backstab me? <laughs> I know. Yeah. And then they're going home. <laughs> oh, I love that. I love that little twist. Do you want, yeah. have you watched all the seasons and you're, so you're totally in. Season one. Yeah. We're, from, we're, from season we're one. Season one. We're a season one household. Oh, good and for so we've you. gone back. Like we just watched our whole thing. We took a trip over Christmas and Brad downloaded um, Survivor China, one of the seasons, and we watched yeah. on the airplane like four <laughs> four episodes. Like it was that binge watching four on the way there. Nice. And Sid's right there watching with us. I mean, we've got her sucked into this. Poor so kid. how do you oh do you? Hey, enjoy listen, we, wait, I'm gonna interrupt you. All right, go ahead. We want to. We think that he and I would be a great duo oh, for Jesus the Amazing Christ. Race. Here we go. That'd be awesome. How great would that be? Have you applied? No. Why not? Because the last time I mentioned it, <laughs> he I have said, children and I a wife love, that I love. I love, my chil- I love my children. I would never do that to them. And you I know, said, well, I have children too, and I love them, and I would do it in like two seconds. But what <laughs> would you be like, doing to them? Oh, no. I would just miss the shit out of them. Yeah. That's all. That's but all. But then you'd bring home a million bucks, and I mean, maybe. okay. Yeah, oh, maybe. Do you see how she already set the precedent? She already set the precedent. Like, she's such a great like silver lining or type lady. An amazing yes, experience she is. Or they would see, you know, think of, I mean, that's for me going into, I mean, I, it was horrible leaving my daughter. But yeah. the when whole you thing hugged was, Brad oh. on that show, I was like, that is unbridled joy. Look at see, that. that. I can't is even go amazing. back there because I, I get teary every time I, I can't even go back there. Because when he, when he came on the island, when he, oh, when he ran out to her, you could tell. She's like, Boom! She was just like, Bleh. "Oh, I was Dude. crying in line." It was so There's, awesome. Yeah, and just as a sobbing, as a spectator, you know, as as a yeah. person who just watches it all the time, there's there's a there's a handful of people that you're like, "Oh my god, that is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen." One of them, one of the experiences that I saw was, um, God, I wish I could think of the guy's name, but he could not stop kissing his son. He was just laying it on like smooch after smooch on his son. <laughs> like he oh. wouldn't let him go and he was just kissing, kissing, kissing. No, and, I know who he, I can't think. I just, oh, I can't think who it is because I just, I'll Google sometimes and, or I'll and Jeff YouTube Probst, like family, Jeff, yeah. family visits. Survivor, Jeff Probst I was love like, him. that was probably oh. one of the most mm. loving embraces I've mm. ever seen. Yep. And, that, and the dad just could not get it. And that's the way I am with my son. Yeah. My oldest son, there's a there's a smell about him mm-hmm. that when I dig my nose into his hair, and I I just could not if if I ever was on Survivor, I mean, think of that bonding. That, oh I mean, that's, God! And that's it. And you're and when you're so disconnected, I mean, you're you're cut off, you know. And I, it's just that intensity of that feeling. I mean, when we knew that they were there, the minute that they said that our family members were there, I started <sighs> crying. I'm like, oh my god, where is he? Where is he? Where is he? And I literally, I'm like, where is he? Where? I sound, I, look, I sound so. <laughs> but it was stupid. so. I'm it like, was, oh, I'm clapping. I think and running all of them, them and just, all of them, oh. all those embraces were so 
genuine. Absolutely. I mean, that's, that's the part that was so... You can't. I mean, yeah. And again, I came I from the perspective of knowing Brad. Yeah. And I'm like... First of all, I was like, oh, he got to go to Survivor. How cool is that? <laughs> and he got to see his wife. That's yeah. so cool, too. I was like, it's so cool to see him. Yeah. You know, well, it's so yeah. neat. And that's one. Of, that's yeah. a unique thing about Survivor. Another unique thing about Survivor was you were very steadfast. I mm-hmm. never really saw you as, you know, when I'm watching, I'm like, oh, here's a character. I've never saw yeah. you as a person, like, break down and really, like, have a lot of trouble. I saw Lisa. Oh, when she I, broke down when she got bit before yeah, that last that, final thing. Then I, yeah, she yeah, lost yes. it. But right. it, has, it takes something pretty... Serious. And that's kind of how, and that's kind of how for the most part I am outside right. of PMS. Right. You know, I, I'm pretty <laughs> level. You know, did we I'm, time this right? I'm, we I'm did pretty, totally we time did. this. Right. <laughs> I'm pretty level. But you're right, but Lisa was emotionally a mess. I mean, I couldn't have imagined spending the first 18 days with her because I only had to spend the second half of the game. And it was just like every day. And I'm but tell, but, I'm not, but I'm, isn't that kind of a neat I mean, in a way, isn't that kind of a neat dissection of um, our modern or, or, or media, because you see this child star, you see this mm-hmm. child actress star, and you think they got it all together. They oh. got whatever they want. They're a star. They got it. They're done. But to see somebody that, mm-hmm. even though they've reached that part or they were famous at one point, that they still struggle with some aspect of their personality. Sure. It's the humanness. When I saw it's, her, it's I saw Blair. It's authentic. Yeah. It's human. That, and that's the thing that connects mm-hmm. us all. And yeah. you're like, well, if I can get. If I can just stop looking yeah. at you like you're famous, yeah, and be like, like oh. you are just real. It yeah. really is kind of totally. like a it levels a playing field. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. it really kind of is, we're, we're, they're all the same. Yeah, and, and again, she drove me crazy with all her Christian mm-hmm. stuff, but that's just me. But see, nobody I else. Yeah. yeah, but um, I I guess I don't know. I I have a real affinity for that one year of Survivor mm-hmm. because. Again, I thought Malcolm was the shit. When I heard about him going to Dartmouth, and I heard about the weight he lost to be on the show, and I was like, he didn't have to do that. He was in probably pretty good shape Uh before that, but he thought, you know what? I probably need to lose a little bit more weight because I'm going to be out in the middle of nowhere, and I need to have less body mass to do these things. Yeah, I was like, oh, shit, he planned it out. And then, so, I mean, you heard all those prelim kind of Mm -hmm. things, and then when you guys teamed up, I was like, oh, my two favorite people. And so I could see how you could be sucked in like nobody's business. You and I would win the amazing race. I'm going to say it right now. I'm going to say it right now. First of all, we'd be a phenomenon because we'd be so fucking fun to watch. And second Maybe. of all, and if I had yeah. to carry a humongous <laughs> wheel of Swiss cheese <laughs> up a you. mountain, thank you, Denise, Denise. Thank you. up a mountain, you would catch it for me. No, I would probably be like, <laughs> oh, my fucking back. Oh, I'm down. <laughs> but oh, my knee. Kids. Oh, my knee. Yeah. Take, it. Take it for me. That's what I was going to tell you. Was with your kids, though, that's the thing. Leaving on that, think of what your kids get to see. If you, if you go and do that, they see nothing is impossible. You can go and do this. You can take risks. I mean, these are calculated risks. I mean, you're not saying you're going to go jump off cliffs, although you could in the race. But, I mean, it's showing your kids a different side of you. I mean, it's, oh, my gosh, and, and how they grow. I mean, Brad and Sid's relationship grew while I was gone. I mean, they had to do things that they would never have had to have done if I was home. Mm-hmm. I mean, oh. Brad had to, we saw, I mean, Brad's the cook in our house. I mean, so he does all the cooking. I don't cook. I knew I loved yeah, him. Like, like, I'm like, I don't do the cooking. But I take care of all the bills. I take care of all the planning. I mean, I do all the transporting for Sydney. And so all of a sudden, all of that was, I mean, so just his role as a parent changed dramatically for that seven weeks. And it shifted, I think, our respect for each other. How, I mean, in, how was in, that in when you came ways. home? Was it hard for him to let go of some of those responsibilities? No. When he, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Here you go. It's all back like, to you. Like, no. <laughs> was the sex, and was was the sex than, incredible when he came back? You or the know, night I was exhausted. The night I came back, fuck no. <laughs> How about the I, night you hugged him on the beach? No, you don't get sex. I saw him for twenty minutes and then <gasps> left. Oh yeah, no, they don't stay. They, they don't stay. No, they don't stay. You I hug him, him on the beach and then he went home. Oh my god. Yeah, I'd no. rather not see somebody. I mean, we played the game and then we lost and then we didn't get picked. And, and then see you later. He goes away. Oh, so, hence the snobby. Oh my like, God, Jeff, that's you know. torture. Jeff Probst, yeah. you bastard. Yeah. You but you also have to think, you know, I was telling myself, it's that steady, like, you're going to see him in a week. Sure. You're going, And now I just got all the fuel I needed, all the emotional fuel. Because I don't need anything else. Because like, for us, it's months. Yeah. You know, we're watching this show mm-hmm. for months. For you guys, it's a it's it, it's one month. Yeah. It's a yes, month. Yeah. It's but month still, in life. one month of your time, in one, one month of your life, you're taken to the point to where you see somebody that you've seen every day for years and you're just reduced to tears. Yeah. Yep. It's amazing. It's an overwhelming. And I, I even remember we, we got letters from oh home. Oh, my God. Yeah. And I didn't even, 
I didn't even, you know, we don't see the letters. They have, they contact our family after we're there. After about a week, they contacted Brad and said, you know, you have to send these letters and anybody else that you think would want to send a letter. So, you know, my mom sent one and my dad and, you know, my, my sister-in-law, you know, and my brother. And so they send these letters and they kind of sift through, I guess, whose letters you're, you're, you're going to get. <laughs> and so I open up and, you know, I kind of yeah. laugh. Here's my mom's and, you know, they're kind of disconnected from the whole survivor experience. And so my mom and my dad's letters were like, you know, yeah, church is good. Um, <laughs> you know, nothing really like, sure. like we're proud of you. Like <laughs> they did the best they could. Yeah. Then I get and I see, you know, this picture of Sid, you know, the Sid's right. gone and, and Brad's letter and, and my brother's letter. And, and again, it's, but it's even before you've opened those up, it's, you know, it's like this contact with home and it's just, you're overwhelmed. Again, it's like, you're snotting and you're crying and, and it's, I bet. it's just, yeah, I don't it's know. overwhelming. I think that's, that's the part that I thought of survivor that I related to was like when they bring it back to home, mm-hmm. when you, I mean, cause I mean, I was definitely emotional when I saw Brad, but I also thought, cause he's a great butt in those blue shorts. <laughs> oh, but besides that, he's still so mad that they made him wear those. He's like <laughs> one looks so pale. <laughs> oh, He's a cracker. Right a he is a cracker and he's, and he's not to the normally, nth degree. He was a cracker then with navy, sh- you know, this navy shirt and brown swim trunks. <laughs> Can I have a darker color to make me oh, look more pale, please? It was yeah. anyways, but everybody's, <laughs> but everybody's reaction was the best. Was was genuine. Yes. it was like we've been doing this for so long. It's yep. so hard. A connection to home. Oh. I was just like, oh. That's so wonderful to watch. Yeah. And I, you know what's funny is I feel bad that I don't watch Survivor other than the Denise's season that she did it. I'm assuming it's the same way for every season has something similar emotional kind of connection wise, right? I'm sure everybody Most, goes yeah. through that. I'm sure yeah. everybody goes, goes through that. Because it's, it, I was going to ask you, like, the, one of the huge things about Survivor is being unplugged. Mm-hmm. Is you only have these people around mm-hmm. you. There's no radio. Nope. There's no television. No there's phone. no internet. There's no phone. There's no ringing. There's no, I got to get to this appointment. Is there a ton of introspection? For me, there was. For the younger players, I, actually, I can't even just say for the younger players. I think it depends on the person. For me, I would go and our beach, there was a place that you could walk up the beach and the way that the rock sat, I called it my lounge chair. It had just enough of a spot that I could kind of sit my butt in and kind of lean back and just look at this little island block. And I would just sit there and I would think about home. Or I would think about, you know, what's happening out here. Just look around like that moment to just take in. Like, oh my gosh, look at where you are. You're in the middle of the Philippines. You would never, if it weren't for this, there's no way you'd be here. So for me, I did. I mean, every day that was it, you know, lay down and you'd think about it. And for a lot of the younger players, Honestly, I think they struggled with that because they were so plugged in. I was not that. I had a flip phone. I mean, so when you think about being plugged in, I had a flip phone before I went to Survivor. (laughs) So I was not plugged in. I wasn't plugged into, you know, smartphones and always being on. And, you know, I get home from work and it's, I try and, you know, I'm a horrible Facebook. I mean, I Facebook all the time. So, I mean, I'm, I'm definitely on online and active, but to unplug from that was wonderful. But for them, it was like painful. Like, oh my gosh, I don't have... Well, if you don't know anything else. Uh, exactly. If you don't know anything else and you can unplug mm-hmm. once in a while, you're like, oh, well, this is normal. Because yeah. I, 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 before the internet happened, I did this. Yeah. And I think you know, if you, if you know nothing else. And I think about my mm-hmm. own kids that way. You know, I think of, you know, number two lost the Xbox. So he's been on the computer doing things. Mm-hmm. It's just one thing to another. Yeah. He hasn't yeah. disconnected it at all, necessarily. Right. Yeah. You know? So, I mean, the idea of being able mm-hmm. to sit back and appreciate what mm-hmm. you have. You know, and, and I, we've talked about this a lot in this podcast is the idea of as human beings being able to enjoy what we have. We can find so many things wrong mm-hmm. all the time, easily, but finding the things that are actually really going well, mm-hmm. there's so many more things that are going great that are going wrong. And again, I guess we're part of the media as a podcast, but I, I see E and I see Bravo and I see all these television, show, television shows that I'm just like, it's all judgment. It's all looking at each other. Who's doing what? Who's doing what? Where? I don't give a shit what's happening with Ryan Gosling and whoever he's dating. Mm-hmm. And so it's it's it. You, in other words, if you're not plugged in, you're not online to know what the latest and greatest is happening, and somehow you're less for that. Yep. You know, and that that's a that is a hard thing for me to deal with when it comes to my kids or anybody else because I think you need to realize that. Walking out into the woods by yourself with absolutely nothing else on you yeah. is a wonderful thing. And when you hear that silence, 
that's normal. Yep. Yeah. That is normal. And that I would, I would think that it. that's what people yeah. get on Survivor because you don't have all those things, which I, I've only had that one time in my life when I was in basic training and we were, you know, road marching 12 miles and you oh, can't yeah. talk and it's got to be quiet and you, you start thinking about all these other things. Mm-hmm. And that's when the beauty happens. Mm-hmm. Right. Because there's so much noise yeah. every day it's nowadays. Static. Yeah. Well, it's and a, I think Joe Rogan even talked about our brains are made to handle our tribe and what's going on within a small circle of our influence in our world. We're not supposed to be knowing what's happening amongst the other 9 billion people that's mm-hmm. going on in the world. That's It's hard for us it's to conceptualize. Yeah. It's hard for us to handle. I can really only handle this much right here, right now. You know, my community, whatever that community mm-hmm. is. And so I wonder if that's what it is, that we start watching, you know, a show about somebody somewhere else and a show, and we start assuming that that's how everything is happening or that's how we all should be. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden you're just like, oh, then I'm not fitting into that norm. Something's wrong with me. And you start talking about body image and all these oh. other things. Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. It's a, a goddamn clusterfuck before you know it. And then we're all screwed. You know, mm-hmm. you know, here's, a, here's another little tiny little beautiful thing about Survivor that we, that <laughs> I would. He's I would, a lover. I, I, I don't like his you. He, he loves it. Do. He loves it. My wife, my wife said, um, if it wasn't for you, I would have thought this guy on Survivor was a total fucking liar. I am a sleep humper. What? What? I'm a sleep, sleep humper. I'm a sleep humper. <laughs> I would. Explain. I would wake. Her? I would wake up in the middle of sex with my wife. Okay. I would wake up. I'd be like, oh shit. I'm sorry, and <laughs> I'd roll over. <laughs> Are you serious? And I'd go to bed. Yeah. Okay. At the beginning of our marriage, I did that a lot. I did that a lot to the point okay. to where I was really pissing her off. Well, yeah, because it disrupts her sleep. <laughs> yeah. I, well, like, I'm just dis- uh, I'm, disrupt- like, I'm disrupting her, I'm disrupting her sleep, and she and and then she's and then she's uh, she's ready to go, and then I'm like, and oh then, shit, I'm sorry. And then I, you like leave her hanging. Because I was I was honestly like I'm really sorry for what I've done. <laughs> Good night. Like we'll finish what you started. Yeah. So there was this yeah. So there was this guy on Survivor who, uh, and and Do you remember you could, who this was. Oh, no, I, don't I, I can't. This. I can't say. I can't. I can't put a name to okay. it. Okay. All I, I, the only thing I know is that I, I believe he was a black man. Okay. Okay. And I hate labels. God, I wish I knew his name. Well, there haven't. I mean, yeah. All I knew was. All I know was it was a season where he was laying next to another black woman, and she called him out on it. She was like, "You need to quit trying to get up on me." And it wasn't Philip. And he said, no, 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 no. no, no. It wasn't. No. Oh, my God. He was, the, he's specialist. so funny. Oh my, the specialist. Oh. Yeah. God. No. Oh. Philip is a whole podcast that, that, all, all upon his own. Met, but no. Yeah. This, and, I, and I wouldn't yeah. know what you're talking about. Go ahead. Yeah. Right. But this guy gets called out by this lady who he's been laying next to and, and on Survivor, I don't know, as a spectator. Mm-hmm. When you're laying there mm-hmm. and you don't maybe you don't have a blanket, you might want to cuddle. You might want to. Absolutely. Wanna, yeah. Jesus. Yeah. It's cold. Oh my god. <laughs> it's imagine. cold. So this lady is is saying you're rubbing up all on me and all this stuff in the middle of the night and he's like I'm happily married. You're crazy. And my <laughs> wife looks at me and goes, "If it wasn't for you, I would think <laughs> yep. that that guy is yeah. totally full of shit and that he was yeah. probably trying to get some sex in the middle of Survivor." And nobody wants to have sex. I mean, there's there are issues with. I mean, believe me, nobody wants to have sex out there. I mean, there were issues with Malcolm with when because I, I asked him after. I said, you know what? As a sex therapist, I can't believe I never asked you this. Did you get? I slept next to you like that whole like after the merge. I slept next. Did you ever get a boner? You know, because I'm like, I don't know. I wasn't God cuddling bless with you, him, Denise. You know, I yeah. wanted to know. What did he say? And, and, uh, because of course, to him, I'm this gross old woman, which is oh, totally stop fine. It. No, yeah. really, stop that's, it. His, that's stop. his nickname. No, that's his nickname for me, though. This gross old lady. Is he being I, sarcastic? Yeah, because I talk okay. about sex with him all, all right. the time. Good. It's like that's dumb. him talking to his mom yeah. about that's sex. I, I, I listen. Mean, I so. cannot wait if yeah. I ever get the opportunity to talk to Malcolm. He sounds really funny. He's, to me. he's a great guy. He, and he seemed like a great about, guy. And they, and they talk about that though. And he's, you know, and he talked about, you know, we start to worry because you don't, because you're under such stress, the body doesn't do what the body normally does. And Whoa. so as a guy, you start worrying, oh my gosh, is there something wrong? Because there are attractive, I mean, on our trip, and we, Angie, so for him, it's like, you know, here's for us, I mean, Angie was, she was beautiful out there. Right. I mean, but I mean, so here, and he slept next to her and cuddled with her. And never once got 
an around. erection. <laughs> Is it like Junior saying that during basic training he never got an erection at you all? Know what, that, so much it, stress. It, it could it's totally so be stress. that 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 really? stereotype of it's, saltpeter or whatever. Listen, mm-hmm. It's hard for me. To, it's just, it's hard for me to imagine as a male who gets bumped the wrong way in the hallway <laughs> and gets a boner <laughs> that you're in the, in the, in the wind blows that. Wow, that's a but really you ha- but interesting. But you have to put yourself in oh, that sure. sort of, like you have to yeah. think, you know, we, you know, you're three days in where you're not eating, you're dehydrated, yeah. it's raining, you're, you're miserable. cold, you're miserable. Yeah. You're thinking about everything I mean, besides You're, you're thinking that. about basic needs, like sure. I'm cuddling before oh, close, you know. Not, I I'm be, not thinking like, like here, three days in. Yeah, I'm like, thinking like two weeks in when we got shit settled. Here, oh, I'm, we have then, an idea how things are going. Yeah. I'm cuddling next to you. Yeah, and then I'm you hard, smell. I'm hard pressed not to have a boner. Oh, and the smell. Yeah, and you smell... I mean, we don't smell as bad as you think, but I think we you're just swimming get used in the ocean. To it. Why would you not you're swimming in the ocean. If you have an ocean, you're swimming in the ocean, and yeah. you're not eating all of the stuff that we normally eat. Oh, which shit. that, yeah. that yeah. makes it just kind of ooze out. Yeah, and pores and nice. But yeah, so no, so yeah, so I wouldn't have been surprised. But you know, I thought about that because I slept and next to. And he said no because he said, he said no. At least like eventually one happened, but he was worried initially on like at in his second season that he played, he was worried, and I think he said something. They never showed it. Obviously, CBS isn't going to show. Like, <laughs> yay, we woke up with morning wood because he worried like <laughs> nice. something's wrong, like something's broken. Right. But you know, it happens. I mean, I never experienced See, like I, like I slept between Malcolm and Michael Scoopin. Now, granted, I didn't cuddle with Malcolm. Right. I never once cuddled with him. Right. You know, Michael Scoopin was more my age, and but I never once felt like wood on my back. You know, well, and I imagine, I, good, I imagine me. I you know what? See, I put myself this, in her. this whole podcast. I didn't think that Denise was going to say, I didn't feel wet on my back. Yeah. Like, like that, that was one was of those things I didn't I'm, expect to hear. And I'm okay with that. <laughs> but but yeah. Michael Scoopin. Yeah. What about him? <sighs> I mean, he was one of the fun, the, 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 the frontiers of frontiersmen. He was one of yeah. the first guys yeah. to do Survivor. Yeah. Right. Uh, what was it? Uh, season two, season yeah. three, whatever. Australian. Yep. He burnt. He falls into the fire oh, yeah. and burns his hands. And well, for him to come back, the whole thing falling off was horrible. Yeah, to me, watching him was. Uh, I loved watching you and watching what um, I. If I went through it, you were one of those people. I thought if I went through Survivor, I hope I would be represented like this. I wish I could portray myself the way Denise is portraying mm. herself. Poised. I really very poised. Yeah, my wife and I re- really, really just you. You weren't entertaining. You no. were one of those people that were um, just a great role mm-hmm. model that I thought. Thank oh, you. I really wish I could conduct myself. It was the normal scene in a very like stressful yeah. in a very stressful uh, place. Now Michael Scoopin, I thought, <laughs> here's a guy. Now I don't know everything about him, but what I did know was that he was in one of the first seasons of Survivor, got really hurt, and here he comes back. What 15, 16 mm-hmm. years later, and he's saying. Physically, I'm in. I'm better than I was back then. Mm-hmm. So it it was really kind of a, a motivating thing to guys that are getting older, oh, yeah. saying, you know what? Just because you're out of your twenties, you're not. Life done. doesn't end. Yeah, yeah, you're not done. And he is. He's in amazing shape. I mean, he's a crazy athlete. Plays basketball. I mean, he is Mr. Physical. I mean, he just does. I mean, but it is. It's you know, it's the same thing that you know you want to do for women. It's like, oh my gosh, forty, you don't die. Right. Like. It's make it or break it. You choose. And and he definitely, I mean, he's definitely in better shape, better health than he was when you saw him on in the Outback, I think. But, yeah. And he says that. Now, uh, I, again, I'll, I'll say it again. I, I love Survivor. So I've watched every, <laughs> I've watched every season. And there was one season, there was one season, I'll ask you this as a woman, there was one season that the ladies completely manipulated the whole thing mm-hmm. and and they ruled it, they ran it, mm-hmm. and there was nothing but women in the end. And I was so angry mm-hmm. as a man. I was so angry. What is it like to go through Survivor as a woman and think, okay, we have guys that are more physical, they might mm-hmm. win more challenges because there's a lot... Because, I mean, more yeah. often than not, well, the well, challenges more are... physically physi- dominant. Exactly. Yeah. Now the challenges that are like puzzles and 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 other things that I thought would be more kind of equal, level they, yep, playing they field. It. Yeah, they don't. There's not as many of those. So as a woman going through Survivor, do you did you feel like it gets broken up into so many different sections? Uh, old versus young, women mm-hmm. versus men. How did you feel when you went into this? Did you feel like I'm the under, I'm an underdog? 
you know, at when I first went in, when I when the game first started, I didn't feel like an underdog because when I when we I mean, I knew when we were waiting the week before we start the game, we're at Ponderosa and we have to wait there. Nobody can talk to each other. You're just sitting and you're oh, really? checking out. Yeah, you're you just, can't talk to anybody. No, you can't speak. I mean, they have handlers that are paying attention. And oh, shit. so you're just watching. You're watching the other players and you're sizing them up and you're checking them out. And I'm thinking, OK, there is not another female in here that I think is physically. I mean, and I, I'm not. A massive, like I'm no brawn. You're, you're but a badass. I mean, but, but you're an athlete, for, though. But for you 43, but for 43, I mean, it's kind of like I'm in way better shape than I was in my 30s. You know, I smoked for 10 years. I smoked. I. Oh my yeah. god, we're the like same yucky. age. We're the same like age. Yucky. Yeah. See, and and I'm in way better health. So, physically compared to the females, I felt I can hold my own with them. And then once I got with my tribe, that became completely evident. Of okay, I've got two women who should not be out here like have no business <laughs> being oh out here God. angie's probably i mean she like her like let's go do aerobics i mean she just was physically not made for the game roxy mentally physically i think she was made for the game but mentally she wasn't made for the game she just broke down so i didn't feel like an underdog at that point and then you know even after it's all been said and done, you feel like, oh my gosh, gender issues in the game and mm -hmm. competitions and it wasn't unfair. It was unfair. You know, there were challenges where, you know, as our tribe just got more and more decimated, you know, yeah. it was decimated. Oh yeah, because it was, there was just one, you and Malcolm. Yeah, yeah right? and, Well, and it, finally, and then they split us, but the final challenge before they split us was a challenge where we had to walk with the, you know, this bamboo pole with these heavy pots of rice and yeah. go through this obstacle. And, you know, they go and they pick, you know, it's down to the three of us. So it's myself and Malcolm and, and Russell and they say to the other tribe, you know, sit two players out. They didn't say what gender. So, of course, they sit out, the two women. Everybody's like, ah, oh, that's unfair. So I was up against. It's three men to two men and a five-foot-tall munchkin. Badass. Yeah. But yeah. Luck, you know, luckily, I held my <laughs> own. But, you know, I still didn't feel like an underdog because in my mind going in, it's CBS's game. It's their game and their rules. And if I want to play, you play by their rules. It doesn't matter. Don't whine. Don't complain. That must have helped just, you a ton. Just dig in and do it. Right. Like, so it doesn't Having matter. Having that mindset. Yeah, just that mindset. So it didn't matter. It's like, you know, we all looked at like, seriously, what the fuck? They're going to sit out two women again? <sighs> so, okay, anyway, and so anyway, yeah. your, uh, your age and your life experience prepared you for the idea of like, fuck, this is their deal. It, We're just going to do what I need to do yeah. and move on. Yeah, and it, and it helps not only during the game, but after the game. You know, I've seen even from my season players that, you know, they think this... 15 minutes in the spotlight is going to be what launches them. It's going to lead, you know, to their promotion, either you know, modeling or acting or whatever it is, because they're so young, they don't have the life experience yet. Sure. You know, myself and artists and even Malcolm, Malcolm's only 26, but he had way more life experience. Sure. And so when it's done, our life goes on. It's, sure. We're not crushed by it again. It was their rules, their game. And once that season ended, it was a business deal. CBS is done with us. People are like, oh, do you get called? No. Jeff Probst, I've never had a conversation with Jeff Probst other than <laughs> he doesn't. If we walked by on the street, he might recognize me, but his life went on. Like, that season's done. It's in the can. Right. It's over. So, and is, is, so is Malcolm off teaching somewhere again? He's not. He is, um, right now, he's in the process of all the, he had done a lot of blogging when he was in Micronesia, and he had written all of these blogs. And he's in the process of getting it into a book form. Oh, cool. So he's been doing that. He writes a blog called Whiskey and Ninja Turtles online. That's The Whiskey and Ninja Turtles. Whis whiskey and Ninja Turtles. Um, it's definitely light reading. <laughs> um, it's Malcolm. It's Malcolm being Malcolm. Pretty much every post talks about him being drunk and waking up and... But sometimes he's he's got a few nuggets in there that are like, oh, that's the Malcolm. Like that's the Malcolm that like the <laughs> intelligence that I know. But um, so he's just hanging out there. He's done. Um, he did like a couple of. I think he's finally gotten an agent or a publicist to to work with. But he's what's just funny living his life. is I I know um, Denise's uh, a niece and a nephew, and they came up to me and they said, "I wasn't supposed to tell you this. I wasn't supposed to tell you this." But look at this. And they showed me a picture on their phone of Malcolm. And they took a picture at Anthony's house. Yes. And I was like, <laughs> oh, my God, that's so awesome. And, she, and she's, like, yeah, she's like, oh, my. I was so excited. I couldn't tell anybody all day at school. And so I was like, oh. <laughs> I was like, you are a stud to not tell anybody at school all yeah, day long. Sure. And a TV star. I mean, 
rented your nieces a TV yeah. stand. But that Malcolm is coming to your house, or you yeah. get to go see yeah. Malcolm. Yeah. And I was like, you're pretty awesome that you're going to be uh, keeping that to yourself. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's they awesome. kept it on so the So Whiskey down. and Ninja Turtles. When, yeah, I see it right Ninja here. Whiskey and Ninja Turtles. I see it go. right here. So there's some and so you have a lot of love for Malcolm, oh, but he's yeah. he's a kid. To me, he's a, I mean, he's 26. I right. mean, so I think of that. I mean, it's... Well, age-wise, he's a kid, but he's also been around the world a time or yeah. two. And so, you know he's what? Ma- he's a mature 26. There's something to be said yeah. about you see enough of the world and it's like, oh, fuck it. Yeah. You know, I'm just going to say what I want to say and do what I want to do. Yeah. And But that's kind yeah. of the thing is that a lot of people grow up and they don't ever leave their small town. They mm-hmm. don't ever... There's a guy that I work with who's never been on a plane. He's got to go down to Texas for a safety seminar or something. <laughs> and he's freaking out. He's freaking out. He's like, hey... Who's going with me? Hey, you, if you come with me, you got to be standing next to me because I'm going to go through the airport. And I'm like, dude, there's signs. There's signs. <laughs> hey, are you and serious? Okay. Yeah, I'm totally serious. Do you, you think I'm making the, this up? These are, yeah, I can see yes. you making it up. <laughs> so you're, so you're, <laughs> you're a dick. No, I'm, I'm just putting it out there. So he's never been on an airplane. He's never been on an airplane. And so to fuck with him, I said the other day, I go, uh, just so you know, the first time I was on a plane, I jumped out. <gasps> you're mean. It's true. Oh, it's well, true. I suppose. It's true, well, I suppose. Yeah. But it is true. Military. It's true. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I actually, um, I was, uh, no? I was, I was working at a factory, and there was a guy that was working with me, and he go, and uh, he was a marine, and we had a, we were, he was a really neat fella, and I said, you know, like, what are you, what are you into? He goes, I'm into doing whatever I haven't done. That's I a go, great motto. I go, what does that mean? He goes. I want to go scuba diving. I want to go skydiving. I want to do everything that I could even think of that I haven't done. I go. You really want to go skydiving? Just like joking around. He's like, yeah, there's a place just north of here that we can do skydiving. I go, you know what? If you do that, call me. I'll go with you. Thinking I'm just going to call his bluff. I'm not really going to follow through with this. And he does it. And he calls me. So we go. Boom. That day we jumped out of a plane. Holy crap. So then I thought, this is fun. This is fun. We jumped. I jumped out of a plane. This is neat. Hey, what if I go into the military and get paid for jumping out of planes? No way. <laughs> so then, yeah. yeah. So that that was the progression. I went. I went from. I've never been like in paratro- a plane like paratroop kind of stuff. Yeah, I was a paratrooper for uh, three years. Very cool. So uh, yeah. much different than s- sport skydiving. <laughs> sport skydiving, <laughs> you gently drift down to the ground. Military skydiving, lawn dart. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! You are a lawn, you are a lawn dart. Every single time I was, he coming, tells stories about guys who don't have their balls in front of the cinches no. when they come down. <clears throat> boom! They catch, oh. the leg straps would oh catch god, their just pop right up in their <gasps> privates and just gone, oh. Oh. smashed, yes. obliterated. So you got it. You, oh. I thought a vasectomy was bad. Your, your straps, oh, your horrible. your straps have to be so tight you're uncomfortable. <laughs> if you're uncomfortable, then you're good. Well, you don't want anything sneaking back there. Correct. <gasps> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So uh, every single well, time. <laughs> well, you know, this. I never thought of that term before. That's they, perfect. Well, no, it's beautiful. Slip and slide. Yeah. Perfect. You know. So every single time I would jump out, for that, I would come exactly. down and go, oh, fuck, oh, fuck, oh, fuck, oh, fuck, oh, fuck, oh, fuck. <gasps> and then I would hit. That's what <gasps> That's what skydiving in the military is like. Much different than yeah, sports I think I'll skydiving. Pass on you know what's funny is Will Smith. <laughs> I think I'm good. I made my mom come to my second one. And my mom did. My mom bawled the whole time, and okay. I came down and I, <coughs> I handed off the parachute, and I was like, "Hey, what'd you guys think?" And my mom was just bawling. And, oh. and now that I have children, As a parent, now mm-hmm. that I have children, I can understand. But at the time, I just laughed at it. And that's like what's saying, "Here, so mom, watch me drive into that wall." Yeah, I'm gonna go die. I'm gonna go die. <laughs> Love you. <laughs> well, Will Smith was on Jimmy Fallon's first night as the Tonight Show. His his first guest was was uh, Will Smith. I'm sorry, not Will Ferrell. Will Smith, and. He skydived when he was in Dubai, and they show him skydiving. And you know, everybody else gets like the parachute outfit on, and they're doing it. He's got like retro '90s Jordans on, a pair of jeans, and some t-shirt. And <laughs> show oh, <wow>. him <laughs> jumping out. And so, well, the the hard part was that I thought that was cool, but <laughs> there was a guy. There's a YouTube video that's run around the internet that is a guy that jumps out of the internet. Or sorry, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That would be interesting. Regress. He jumps out of the plane. It knocks him. He hits something when he jumps out that it knocks him out cold. So the video camera is the GoPro on his helmet, right? And so you see can see nothing to, pull. nothing to pull. And so you see his hands like flapping around in front of him because he's he's unconscious. You see his friends come in because it's like a group of like 10 guys come in and you can see him 
drifting up and down in front of him, kind of looking to see what's going on, and they can see something's wrong, and they swoop in. One guy grabs an arm. The other guy grabs his chute and pulls it, and he lands unconscious. Okay, that's terrifying. Oh I will, I mean, I will never do what he talks about. No. I mean, I think it's awesome. People want to do things like that, and it sounds exciting, and I think the idea of a parachute, or but there is something to... I don't know. As, as I get so older, good. as I get older, I'm just like, you know what? I have enough things going against me at this point. Yeah. I have thin, well, I have thin mint cookies. I have a freezer full of thin mint cookies that can take my life at any yeah. point. I have so many things in my life. I am not going to jump out yeah. of an airplane. Well, it's the risk. It's I mean, I it's it's the risk of it. I mean, that's even like going to do the survivor thing. We had to sign the contracts, and we had to sit down with Sydney and go through. They had a list. They made her sign the contracts, which is so not legal. That's but dumb. It's dumb. I mean, you can't. Yeah. And she was eight at the time. So for hello. Survivor, yeah, yeah. Oh, to so, say that what were they? What was she signing? She was signing documents that said basically confidentiality. <clears throat> if you breach confidentiality, we'll sue you. Oh, blah blah blah. Okay. But some of them were risk things, and one said, you know, uh, you know, fill in the blank. You know, I'm aware that so and so. So basically, I'm aware that Denise Stapley is going to participate. Could be participating in all of these activities: skydiving, sky jumping, blah 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 blah. And basically that. I could die doing it. And I remember, you know, telling you, do you understand what that means? And she said, yeah, basically if you get hurt, it's your own fault. And at that time, you know, making that choice to go do that, so different. Like I would go do Survivor where I could die on the plane trip on the way there. I could have, who knows what could have happened when whatever it was bit my neck. Right. But the risk seemed more calculated. Jumping out of a plane, not happening. It's just not happening. It's like there's something in my brain that just goes, the risk is too great. Like there is too much on the line here. And that's yeah. like, it's like saying, yeah, I just want to test the brakes. I just, I just want to, I want to go a hundred and just see if the brakes will stop me. Like, right. yeah, no, there's not enough. Like I was pretty sure like yeah, CBS, they really don't want to get sued. They, right. they really don't want anyone to die. <laughs> not that the parachute company does either, right. but you know. Well, the risk seems a little when, better. When I, when I saw that episode, I remember, again, my wife and I, side by side, holding hands. Holding hands because it was... I mean, <gasps> I'm kidding. Oh, um, but watching. And when she was crying <laughs> oh. about the pain of that bite, I was like, she goes, I wonder what bit her. And I'm like, listen, I don't whatever know. fucking happened, it's bad. And because I know she's done, she does triathlons, she does swimming. I mean, she does some serious shit. And so if she's saying she's having a hard time, it's a pretty hard time. Whereas if, you know, what's the Blair? Bla- Lisa? Like, uh-huh. I, I referred to her as Blair. Sure, that's why but I her real her name out. is Lisa. Okay, that's Lisa. Okay. Well, hearing Lisa bitch about something, I was like, oh, okay. All right. <laughs> yeah. So you okay, got to so hang you, out? Oh. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> when, when you're like, like, sh- you're like, you're like shaking and you can see the things on your yeah. neck. I was like, yeah. Oh, if I start shit. touching it, it'll start like waking up here. <laughs> like it, does, it starts like exactly. Does it now, really? When we talk, oh, I start to like scratch. Sorry. Like no, it'll eventually it'll have two little dots. It'll just kind of pop up right really? on my neck. Oh, because uh-huh. so, there's scar tissue. So it's there. a spider. We don't know. We have no idea. It, but you know what? It's most likely they think it was a centipede, a Philippine centipede. Oh. I'm gonna tell my wife that she's gonna be so. Mm-hmm. She hates centipedes. Yeah, and she's gonna be freaked out when I'm like, oh, you know what's bit. Denise? It was centipede. a big centipede. And she sucked it up. Yeah. She sucked it up and it was no big fucking deal. Yeah. So it deal was a, with it. What she wasn't a puss. Oh, it was a deal. Oh, because oh, you, oh, yeah, oh, that was a bad deal. No, but, Sorry. Yeah, but yeah, you did suck it up because you didn't have a choice. Exactly. But, oh, you yeah. know, and watching yeah. watching Survivor and watching people that y- you have injuries and then you have people that get hurt because of no fault of their mm-hmm. own, uh, being either being dehydrated mm-hmm. or what, to... to Play a game that you're so passionate about that you uh-huh. thought, oh my god, it's on the, I've seen uh-huh. this show so many times. I can't believe I'm on it. Oh. You get there, oh my god, it's really tough. And then, wait, wait, I'm not done. I, yeah. di- I didn't say quit. I didn't say give. I didn't say uncle. And that's exactly where some of those tears I know were combined with that. It was, you are at like day thirty. I think it was day thirty six. I think, and I was like, you have three days left. This is not going to be what sends you home. And you know, I was mad. And I'm like, suck it up. Like, suck it up. You have a challenge. Like, suck it up. But it just, yeah, it was scary because it got worse and worse and worse. And they prayed and it didn't help. And, <laughs> and, oh, fuck. which is what I'm going to go talk about in Utah, which will be great. So it'll be <laughs> awesome. So, about people are you, praying. Are you yeah. trying? Are you just, ins- <laughs> are you instigating people? Is that, is that no, what's happening there? Or no. And it's, no. I, you know, you guys talked about, you know, I'm, I'll make it brief. Basically, I'm going to speak at the National Atheist Convention. 
okay. which will be very interesting. But about so faith. you so do you feel like you be, you believe that there's no God? No, they've asked. They said, "Would you call yourself an atheist?" And I said, "No." The best oh, okay. the best I would call myself is an apathetic agnostic. Okay, I don't know. And sure. I don't care. Oh, like I, just, yeah. I don't know and I don't care. I've like, never I don't, heard like, that. I don't worry about it. Apathetic agnostic. I'm an apathetic agnostic. Basically, I'm, I don't apathy's think that I don't good, care. Apathy's not a good I don't know thing. But in this, it? but in this, in this, basically, it's that sense of I don't believe that I'm so smart to know that I, to believe that I know everything about the universe or about what's going to because I haven't died, so I don't know what's going to happen. Or somebody, so I, or you don't believe in a book. Somebody says this is it. Right. Right. Sure. But so I don't believe that I know it all. So I don't know. But I'm also not going to spend my living hours worrying about it. It'll be what it'll be. And when I get to that point, now would you? I'll find would, out. Would you huh. see yourself? Did you ever think that you would be doing things like this if it wouldn't have been for winning Survivor? Speaking, absolutely. Yeah. I hate public speaking. <laughs> I really. I mean, I really? public speaking was not my first. Like, I would get anxious. Like, just in like this is fine, but like presenting. Yeah, even it's the, presenting it's the number for one work, fear. It was, yeah, yeah, it's like I start sweating immediately. Um, but it's different with the Survivor piece. It's been a blast because it's. It's different when it's work, you know, when I'm going up and I'm talking about, you know, like sex therapy or NMC related to like medical issues, it's different because there's something about knowing there could be somebody in that audience that's going to call bullshit, you know, yeah. or, or is going to say, hmm, prove it. Like, tell me, document, tell me, you know, tell me what publications you read or where you got that research. And there's an anxiety with that about kind of that not being prepared or having sure. it be good oh, enough. Sure. Right. But going and talking about Survivor. Nobody can argue with that. I know right. my experience. Right. I know what I took away from it. I know the impact of it. So like going and doing, you know, public speaking has been fine. What I'm doing in April for the convention is way different than what I've normally done. I mean, I'm, I'm essentially going and talking about something I Why never, were you tapped for that? It, it's, I didn't even know this group existed or this convention existed. And, and say what's the convention um, again? Uh, the National Atheist Convention okay. in Salt Lake City, Utah. Over Easter weekend. I wonder why hmm. all that timing. It's, I mean, it's interesting. It was <laughs> the in the National like, Atheist, yeah, Atheist Convention, Convention in Utah. Utah. Well, and the it's moon's because aligned. there's well, and it's because there's a large apparently there's a large Mormon, um, former Mormon population that they kind of want to be able to reach out to to know oh. that hey, there's kind of this space and place of non-theist. I'm sorry. Though. I was being really cynical no. and I was thinking that was shitty and no, they're being I thought, well, I thought, really like, positive. Well, Good for I them. Thought, like, oh my God. Okay. It's over Easter weekend. Like, doesn't that feel like <laughs> I'm not even religious, but I feel like, isn't that a little like blasphemous or something? Am I, am like I just uh, in a tiny like, bit kicking like, ball, God in the like, balls? Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, like if it, <laughs> sorry, you, Jesus. Like if you do exist, like I'm kind of screwed. Yeah. If I you're in this. serious trouble. But no, they apparently just saw, they watched the, the season and they had picked up on certain things that I had said. Um, you know, there had been a scene, you know, after I'd watched Roxy, Roxy had been on the beach and she was speaking in tongues and the producers had talked to me and I said, you know, I, I get it. You know, it's just, it's, it's just not my gig. It's just not right. my thing. Whatever works for her power to her. But basically we've got water to get and speaking in tongues on the beach, you know, to pray for sunshine. It's just not my thing. Yeah. Pick it up um, and let's go. Like pick it up and let's go. Yeah. Um, if it works for you, great. And then um, just sorry. some different things, sorry. Some different things that they'd heard just through the season that made them kind of wonder what my beliefs were. So they just reached out to me via Facebook and said, huh. you know, hey, we're curious, you know, and they were certain, they were really respectful, you know, hey, we don't know if, if you're a person of faith, we don't want to offend you, but we were curious and we're, you know, can you tell us your insight? And so I just shared with them and said, hey, I could come and talk about, you know, the experience. So. I'm going to go talk about the whole prayer experience. And Do you think that it's a fear-based thing? Because we've talked a lot about religion on this podcast. Mm -hmm. But do you think that it comes down to the unknown mm -hmm. develops fear? I mean, it could be like a I racial mean, It could be a racial thing. It could be whatever it is. If you don't understand something, mm -hmm. it's scary. Mm -hmm. And so if you, if, you have an, if you don't know about the unknown after this plane, so to speak... It's scary, yeah. and so you have to have something to rely on. And so when I when I hear of people, we've talked about the idea of um, Matt talked about today that one of the favorite things he hears, and it's the same as mine, is when my youngest is laughing, and it's he's a very lovey, carry kid, unbridled, Aww. crazy. When he is laughing. Laugh. Yeah. It's a beautiful thing. It, it, it fills you up with, yeah. with a bunch Aww. of love, and it's so funny and it's so heartfelt. Don't get me wrong, his kids annoying the hell out of me. <laughs> <laughs> but when his youngest is laughing uh -huh. like that, I can't help but start laughing. 
and not and not be mad. You know, I'm just I'm just Aww. like, oh my yeah, god, that is one of the yeah. most beautiful and sounds. So, and so I, I preface that with saying that if someone were to happen to him and he died, mm-hmm. and so I had a hard time with the idea of saying, okay, so he's he's in heaven now. I'll see him at a different time. I'll move mm-hmm. on from that. I said that I feel like it takes away from him as a person and not dealing with the reality of I got to enjoy him for who he was here. Mm -hmm. And so we had this whole conversation about that. And then um, in the Olympics recently, Mm -hmm. uh, there was the the half pipe Mm -hmm. for the Olympics, the skier that died a year ago when she was doing half pipe for the X Games. She had her brain aneurysm. she Mm -hmm. ushered in. She She was the advocate for this particular event and she died at it into the x games and then to the olympics and this is the first year it's been the olympics and she died last year but she was the main advocate for it they did all these ceremonies for her and they interviewed her mom of course and she said um i used to think that i used to think that what would i have done without her what do I, I can't help me out. Now you're gonna fuck it all I up. I am gonna fuck it you, all up. You know so what? You took a me. very beautiful moment and, and you you're smeared it with shit. And you're gonna you clean smeared it. Up. it. And you're gonna clean it up. I'm gonna clean it up. She said something like, uh, "The best part about her was the fact that I got to uh, enjoy her while she yeah. was here." I used to think it, I couldn't imagine my life without her. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And now I can't imagine my life without having no, known her. her. No, there it was. Mm-hmm. Perfect. Perfect. And so I think that that is what yeah. kind of encapsulates everything. Yeah. I think that we have this fear of what's what's going to happen. Yep. I don't want my children to die. I couldn't imagine that. Not. But I would hope that I'd have the wherewithal to be like, I had the chance to know this person. Yep. You know what I mean? And I think that I haven't had this with my other two children, but Junior for sure, because he's my first. I remember having dreams of him dying. I had dreams of him dying. And I got to the point where I had enough of them because just the fear of being a new parent that I was just like, okay, this is, I'm getting fucking tired of this. I can't control that. If it happens, it happens and I have no control. So I got to let it go. So if it happens, it happens and and I'm done. And so that has bled into my other kids to the point where that mom put it so succinctly Mm -hmm. to me. I was watching that show and of course... You can't watch the Olympics without crying at some point during really? the day. Oh fuck, it's terrible. You're so emotional. And so I'm like, yeah, I'm a basket case. I love you, but and you're so, emotional. <laughs> I'm emotional. So I'm watching, going. I looked over my wife. I'm like, could you imagine saying that any any better? Could you imagine yeah. having that poise in front of TV cameras mm-hmm. and whoever was interviewing you and yeah. saying, you know what? I'm just happy I got a chance to know that person. You know, yeah. I said that's the it's way the I acceptance. want to react. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's acceptance. It's and acceptance. And, and you need to get to a point where you can have that level of humility it's not about me and what i've lost and all this terrible angst i had the chance to see this person or do this or know something you You know know what what on that note i'm gonna take that and say i am really thankful that i got to meet (laughs) Dennis. I'm been, not kidding. It's been three I'm hours. Not, is that why? Hey, oh I, we have to say goodbye. Yeah. We have to say goodbye to Denise. My family thinks I'm missing an action. Right no, they now. don't. I've been, Facebook, I've been Facebooking your husband. Oh, You're good. fine. Okay, good. When, when I say when I say that I'm really really thankful for meeting you, I, I tell my wife uh, when we first started dating, I said I don't really want to say I love you because that's just such a fucking stupid cliche type Aww. thing. I would much rather say I enjoy you because oh, me fantastic. enjoying you means so much more than me saying I love you because people just say it flippantly. So I, oh, that's Denise, great. I really enjoyed you being with us tonight. Aww. Todd. Yeah. Oh, wait, what, really, really quick. I don't really enjoy you. Just a second. <laughs> you don't Denise, enjoy me at all. <laughs> what is it? Is there anything that's coming up? I know you do like, um, you did this reading, you did a, re, a recent reading thing with um, Prairie Schools. You do a lot of cool things. So is there anything that's coming up? Soon promote that you it. want to promote? promote uh, it. The only thing that's coming up, I'm heading out to California to do Reality Rally, which doesn't necessarily benefit our community, but it's to raise funds for a breast cancer uh, resource center out there called Michelle's Place. Mm-hmm. So I'm going out and I'm racing with a 21-year-old uh, fantastic kid uh, by the name of Brandy, Brandon who's autistic and they lost their dad, his dad, um, to leukemia in December. Um, so I'm racing, doing this. It's kind of like an amazing race. Um, type event out in California. So, so it's, it's called r- the it's called the Reality Rally, and it was started by Jillian Larson, who was in Survivor Gabon. Okay. And so put, when I when we'll I put a link this, on there for yeah, you. Yeah, awesome. Put a link on there. Oh my gosh, that'd be awesome. And when is that exactly? That is 
oh my gosh, I think it's the third week in April, 11th, 12th, and 13th. I don't know if that's right, but I believe it is. Okay. Wow. Well, the awesome. podcast will definitely be up before then. So people will see a link to this. Well, you know what? Listen to this. Listen to what we're saying. Go to the link. It'll be posted right below, right below the podcast or on Facebook because we're on Facebook. Todd, my main man. <laughs> People already listen to us. They know where to get us. How can they tell a friend of theirs to listen to us? Or where could they go? <laughs> go to theprimalscream.org. That's our website. And on there, you can like some, like us on Facebook. You can follow us on Twitter. Uh, you can follow us on Pinterest. I try to be pretty savvy with Pinterest. I love, well, my wife would tell you I love Pinterest. And I'll be the one to tell you that I love Pinterest too. I love finding stuff on Pinterest and putting it into different categories. I love organizing things. I get a little anal like that. It's very not much not like me, but when Pinterest came around, it made me happy. I love it. I watch TV while I Pinterest. Oh my God. So uh, <laughs> I do it all and the time. He also likes Personally, he likes as well, I like long walks on the beach, and I like sweet nothings in my ear. And mm. pedicures so, and manicures. Not so much. but uh, <laughs> Just pinning those special things. <laughs> oh, exactly. I like taking my emotions, attaching them to something physical, and, and pinning and them. And pinning it. Perfect. Perfect. Oh my visual. God. Do you even yeah. have a penis at this yes, point? I do. Thank you. All very right. Much. Go ahead. It's not down to my knee. Like, Denise said earlier, but Which it's 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 average. There's no it's room average. Right. Yeah, exactly. There we go. So please get on our, our webpage, <laughs> follow us on Twitter, follow us on Facebook, like us, hop on. We'll have all these things on there. Um, Denise, I know you. I appreciate you, but it really was a fascinating conversation. <laughs> hey, it was one of the fastest it was three fantastic. Hours podcasts I've ever done. It's been it was hours. fantastic. Oh, thank you guys. It was a blast. Did a oh great job. And if you ever and I mean this sincerely. If you ever want to come back on, talk about whatever you want to, promote whatever you want to, even if you want to come on and be like, I just want to hang. I just want to hang and maybe have a beer because you didn't get to. We'll do yeah. kink. Of she the had week. magnesium. She's what? Good we'll do go. kink of the week. Holy <gasps> oh shit! Oh my god! Denise just. <laughs> I swear to God, this is one of the great things I like about this podcast. Exactly. Is that two weeks ago, I wouldn't have imagined what we were doing today. And, exactly. And and meeting people, I love the meeting, the different people. I never would have, I best. maybe never would have bumped into Denise. Well, listen, we started this thinking that you and I enjoyed talking to each other. Yeah. And maybe That's somebody awesome. else would like to his, listen to us. Probably not true, but we like <laughs> listening to each other. True. And then we have found over time that we have had the best fucking time having meeting yeah. people. Oh, it's, it's been the, the greatest people. thing ever. It's meeting people. It's been fantastic. And if you learn anything about sex tonight, that's all Denise. It wasn't me. I'd like to take credit for that. Well, oh, no. You maybe don't take, no. you learned a little something from Matt. No. Sorry. No? No. So <laughs> we're also on YouTube, the Primal Scream podcast. Look it up. You can check it out. And we're going to get uh, Denise's podcast on in a few days so that's it fuck yeah. it that's and we'll it. post uh the things you want to promote awesome. so we'll have thank it on there for sure oh my gosh what a night <laughs> thank you it's only begun yeah Woo-hoo. so i'm matt i am todd i'm denise yeah that's it adios good night